this world has known war for centuries, but peace is finally preciously near. We set out on the ocean to secure that peace. Failing this mission would surely plunge us into darker days. episode 173 of the gamers in beta podcast this is your host captain mike m happy to report that i'd have a new television set up in my office this week but now i have some first world problems i need a pc guru to help me out with some display issues and i'm Corey atwood a writer for bago games and i was late to the podcast today because i was playing and losing uh multiplayer on gears of war 4 so to me <laughs> And this is Jay, Maniac17, and I've been grinding my gears, uh, trying to get through the campaign, but we'll talk more about that later. What's going on, everybody? Um, Joe can't be here tonight because he's out um, doing some stuff. He's got a friend in town from Florida, so hopefully he's having a good time. We miss you, Joe. (laughs) Miss you, Joe. Who for you not being here? And unfortunately... Uh, Sean was called into work, so he's delivering the garments to Vermont, so he can't be here either. So I look forward to when those guys return, and uh, hopefully next week. But uh, we got a good show planned, lots of stuff to go over. Uh, so let's jump right into the news, gentlemen. Um, the Star Wars Rogue One trailer was released this week. I think this is the second trailer, if I'm correct. Yes. And uh, thoughts, impressions? Oh, that, I, got, I had like goosebumps watching that trailer. Every time I watch it, that intro music gets to me. I'm Every time I see it, I get more and more excited. I'm a little disappointed that still no one has mentioned Kyle Katarn. He's like a, a, a favorite character of mine who is supposed to be involved in this whole stealing of the, the uh, Death Star plans, you know, before – all the rights from Star Wars went back to Disney and they wiped all the extended universe stuff. But I'm just kind of hoping that there's going to be some sort of reference to him. But I'd actually rather that be safe for the movie. What are you, Jay? Uh, both of these uh, trailers, the first one and then this one, both just really have me excited. I want to see it. Uh, I think this is going to be excellent. And it's going to be nice to have uh, something that's kind of a, an extended uh, storyline. Uh, you know, kind of, I guess maybe this is a... Uh, what a prequel or a in the middle quill, whatever we want to call it. So this day, <laughs> it, yeah. it takes place like just before new hope. So it, it's like, right. a, like a 3.8, I guess you want to call it. It's not, uh, yeah. like, it's not like three and a half. It's like just before four. So yeah, I mean, when they, they do make like a, a, a passing mention of it. They're like a lot of Bothans died to bring us this information. And they mention you know, we got these plans for the Death Star. And that's exactly what this movie covers is the stealing of those plans. Yeah, so th- that's going to be good, you know. It's definitely exciting to see, um, you know, new characters and things like that. You can certainly get burnt out rehashing the same old characters, or at least I can. I know some of the diehards are like, just give me, you know, give me the standard people and that's good. And I, they're good to go, but... 
for me, I like to see some new stories, some new content. Um, does anybody fear that you know Disney is going to run this Star Wars thing into the ground? I mean, when is the next one supposed to come out? Next next holiday? Uh, I don't know if it's 2017 or 2018, like the actual yeah. next numbered edition. But I mean, Disney takes pretty good care of its properties. You know, it's, yes. it's, it's done very, very well with uh, all the Marvel films. And I think they know what kind of property they have now. So I'm I'm not too worried about them running this running this into the ground as long as the people who who have been in charge so far continue to do so because I really liked episode seven a ton and um, this this has me very excited especially as someone who's like a fan of the extended universe like it was very I I felt it was very sad when they wiped all of it but I get why they did it so they could lay everything out themselves and not have to worry about you know this or that because that extended universe was enormous. So I was sad to see it go, but at the same time, I'm I'm looking forward to what they can do with it. Yep, it should be uh, interesting. I know you know the appeal is so strong that even they could weather the whole Zsa Zsa Binks thing from many years ago, right? So they'd really have to screw something up to run this into the ground. I think so too. As long as they're not you know just like pumping them out like crazy, and um, they seem to be pretty. Um, they they know what makes a Star Wars movie. I feel like because when the um, prequels were made. I don't think the the soul of Star Wars was there because Star Wars is more about like practical effects and everything seems kind of beat up and old even though it's also futuristic and there was none of that in the prequels it was all very shiny and new and CGI nobody wanted that shit <laughs> <laughs> No this is, it definitely looks gritty in all the right places so far so we'll And see. I was looking at the uniforms and stuff and I'm like oh man this looks like the original 3 movies you know that uh, Four, five, six, kind of you know that seeing those uh, imperial uniforms and stuff and the ships and stuff. So that, that yeah, and was it, really what made me go, oh, I want to see this so bad. It should too, because it takes place like just before. So like it right. makes sense that like Vader is not the the leader of the Empire. He is an underling, uh, a few levels down. There there are generals that are more powerful than him. He was not you know in charge actually in in um, a New Hope. There was actually that other general. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Yeah. So, like, I, I'm excited that Vader's going to be in it, and he is also in his old position. And I'm kind of glad that they haven't really blown their load as far as trailers go with Vader. You know, Vader hasn't – I don't even think he's spoken in any of the trailers yet. You just heard him breathing, which yeah. just, like, you know, gets everybody's Star Wars boner, like, completely just <laughs> – <laughs> Now, do we know if there's actual – um, a new Darth Vader actor, or is this CG, or what is this? Uh, I don't know about who's actually in um, the costume. I, don't, I haven't looked that up. I kind of want as little information as I can get. I'll, I watched the trailers, but I'm really not digging in too deep and whatnot. I just want to go in and really enjoy it, kind of like I did the, the last uh, Star Wars movie that came out. I did the same, I, you know. Kind of tried to go in, uh, you know, other than trailers, went in blind. And so I, I'm pretty sure James Earl Jones is voicing him again. I'm almost positive. I don't know if that's been confirmed or not. I'm pretty sure he's uh, he's voicing him. So I think that also may be why they haven't had him speak yet is because they want that to be like a an in-film reveal. I think they did a good job about not blowing it with all the trailers for um, episode seven. Like there were a lot of reveals that like you didn't even see until the theater, like when they when they first showed the Millennium Falcon. Like that wasn't in any of the trailers, and that was like such a sweet moment, in, like oh, in the yeah. theater. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, you knew it was in there because it, you know they had the news stuff that out there that you couldn't miss. I mean, Christ, it was on on the local channels and you know in the newspapers and everything. You know about them pictures of of the uh, sets, but uh, you know other than that, and so this one I'm kind of doing the same. And well, it is very topical because it comes out two months from today, December sixteenth. So yep. not too much uh, longer to wait. And uh, just a few minutes ago, Corey said, you know, Disney takes very good care of their properties. And the same can be said for Rockstar, gentlemen. Uh, certainly they do not beat us over the head with annualized franchises. They wait till they're ready, till everything is uh, well cooked or overcooked. or They don't serve it up raw and just slap it in your face. <laughs> Even if that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what we're trying to what we're trying to get at is that um, Rockstar earlier today tweeted out a sort of, what, Rockstar logo that's sort of in the Red Dead Redemption type font in a red background. And that was With it, Just right? a red background, yep. Uh, yeah, that was it. 
And that yep. sent the uh, Twitters and social media a flutter. And there's been speculation on Reddit that the game is going to be called uh, Red Dead Redemption. And then we've seen other more crude uh, markups of an Indian with a star on his face. And they're calling the game Red Dead Renegade. And I would hope that they don't go that route because I can only imagine the backlash. Um, but I don't know. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> I can easily see how that's going to go. But anyways... Um, Gamers complain? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, well, I just think, you know... They're a very I mean, happy bunch. I yeah. just think, you know... Um, I'm not going to get into the whole social thing. Anyways. No, uh, but I think this is this is a perfect example of PR using social media right. I mean, look at the hype that they have gotten out of a picture. Yeah, a picture with, with no... It's like a non-picture. It's just yeah. literally like font. It's not yeah. even a picture. Like, they are very good at You don't even know if it was intentional at this point, right? Oh, no, no, there's no way that was not intentional. There's, they're not pretty looking. good at their PR, I think. Yeah. They're, they're I mean, you could have deleted, they certainly could have deleted it. Uh, they could have, yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's no way. This, this, is, this is intended to garner attention. I mean, and it might not even be Red Dead. But, uh, I mean, I think it, that the chances of it not being are probably pretty damn slim. But, you know, I mean... Could well, be something else. Could be a well, remaster, which I yeah. highly doubt, but it could be a remaster. Yeah, I, I wouldn't see them do that. They got so much attention when they got uh, Red Dead on backwards compatibility, and I think only the diehards played through it. And people that said they were going to play through it and raved yeah. about it on Twitter never got to it. Um, you know, I played very little. Right. I think that's the whole t- – I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of backwards compatibility, but <laughs> – it's a feather in the cap of Microsoft, and not many people use it longer than a day or two. They stick their toe in the water, and then they pull out. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of backwards compatible games that I play the heck out of, or as Mike has mentioned, I play the shit out of. Um, but Red Dead just, yeah, I think that's true. It, it garnered a ton of attention and then kind of fell off. But, uh, you know, a new game coming out, I mean, look at, look at the, just like I said, one tweet with a picture in it is done. Now that that picture of the uh, the Native American guy, uh, Red Dead Renegade, where is that supposedly? Where did that supposedly come from? It was just on a um, sort of Xbox fanboy website, um, and so they just there was like the tweet that was the image in the tweet. So I'm not sure where did exactly this, it came from. So they didn't say where they got it from, or like how reliable is that website? Have they tweeted uh, like things like this in the past? Does anybody know? I don't no? think the image came from them themselves. I think they actually like were retweeting it. I think even to their credit, they might have said like, we don't think this is the real image. Uh, okay. it's, it's a site that a lot of times is trying to be at the forefront of a story by um, making stories out of rumors, um, but they mm. do generally within there somewhere, you know, state that. So that, I guess that's the best way to explain it. But, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting. We'll see. Uh, who knows? Uh, by the time this uh, posts on the uh, on the uh, podcasts networks or whatnot, uh, they may have answers by then. But uh, yeah. here's a, these are our speculations at this point in time. So. Yeah, so if you're listening right now and you already know what it means, just think back to the time when you didn't. That's where we're at right now. So we envy you for knowing, but uh, we don't. Um, I'm certainly eager to hear more. It's been a while since we've had a um, new Rockstar game. When did uh, GTA V come out? Two, three years ago? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, then it came out again for PS4, the first right. person mode. I mean, but they, I mean, they're really, really heavily supporting GTA Online. New stuff yes. comes out for that yeah, they are. constantly. So, like, it wouldn't surprise me if they now have a completely dedicated team just to do GTA Online. That's something, some people, that's all they play. Is GTA Online? It's got like a super dedicated audience to it, but it wouldn't surprise me if they have like a dedicated team for that, and then said we have to start a new project. Hey, what about Red Dead? So like I, I'm positive it's Red Dead, whether it's a new one, whether it's a remaster, which probably not. Um, I don't know, but I'm I'm definitely excited for it too. Wouldn't it be amazing if they did you know the Fallout Four thing? Hip. It'll be out in three months. That'd be so great. So yeah. great. I, I don't see, I don't want to, I wouldn't hold my breath, but yeah, that would kick ass. It would be exciting for sure. And um, it'd be interesting, you know, Rockstar is so powerful that they don't need the holiday sales 
You know, they don't need the holiday window to generate sales. You know, they'll right. get sales. They could put their games out whenever, and they will sell extremely well. So they, if it's, they were along the lines of, like, like uh, GTA was. You know, I mean, with, with that, you know, when they release stuff, they don't need a lot of lead up. I mean, the, the game's just going to sell. Right. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't uh, didn't a f- like GTA four and five both of them were supposed to release in the fall, both got pushed back to spring. Like it happened two GTAs in a row, didn't they do that? I know five definitely got delayed. I'm almost positive four four did. I think it did the exact same thing. It was it went from like November, then pushed to March or something like that. But like you said, Rockstar doesn't it doesn't matter. Rockstar is like above that. They don't give a shit. So it's interesting. It says GTA 5 released September 17, 2013. So that means it released right at the time that the new Xbox is released? Uh, no, it was originally on 360, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. But it That's wasn't. right. There was a big deal about people wanting it for the one. Uh, yeah, well, the one came out later. Yeah, they they were they were quoted as saying like no, it's never coming to the never coming to the next gen consoles. Cuz I remember I actually wrote an article why it was like it was like top 5 reasons why you know, GTA will definitely be coming to the next consoles. And I got like, like in the comments, people like threaten me. They're like, it's not, fuck you. That's that's like, why I played mine on PC because this came right. out right at the same time the new consoles were coming out, like a month or two before. Yeah. Yep. So the consoles came out in November of 2013. This came out September 17, 2013. Right. Okay, so that wasn't I wasn't pushed back to March then. I must be thinking about something else. It could have been. I'm not going to go through the whole wiki to scan it. Um, let's move over to Skylanders, gentlemen. We haven't talked about Toys to Life in a long time. It's I not a not, bad thing. I'm not um, on the Skylanders uh, bandwagon anymore. This will be the first year that I'm not purchasing any, and I think they actually come out this week. But um, it's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the original Netflix series, Skylanders Academy. Now, if this was just going to be a cartoon on like you know the Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon or something. I don't think I would give it as much um, peace of mind as I want to right now. This is something that's coming out on Netflix, and Netflix, would you agree, has a good reputation with their original content? Oh, hell yeah. A lot of it's good, but I mean they, this year alone, they've thrown so many things at the wall. Like there have been failures that not many people have talked about. Like um, uh, one just recently came out uh, – Back off, haters! Have you guys seen that one? They're mm. they're pushing that one pretty hard right now. I think I've only watched some of the first episode. And I'm like, yeah, looks like they're going for a very Napoleon Dynamite thing here. But uh, yeah, they do have a couple of. Out. They do have. A, I mean, they threw so much at the wall. There are a few flops, but the ones that are good are so so good. So I mean, you know, this this could be good. But isn't there quite a dedicated following for Skylander still? Well, that's what I want to get to. Let me give some of the facts first. So, uh, the show is being led by Futuramas Eric Rogers. Ooh. Okay. Oh. Um, Skylanders Academy also features the voice of Justin Long, Ashley Tis- Tisdale, Jonathan Banks, Norm MacDonald. Um, Susan- Norm MacDonald? Norm MacDonald's a voice in Skylanders? Yeah, he is uh, Glumshanks. Uh, Susan Sarandon, Daniel Wu. Bobcat Goldway, the Demon uh, Mind, the Diamond Minecart, the YouTube guy, uh, Parker Posey, James Hetfield of Metallica, Parker Posey and uh, Bobcat Goldway. I yep. I'm very interested in actually seeing this now. Um, Catherine O'Hara, Chris Diamondopoulos, and Harland Williams. What? Um, <clears throat> so so those are some of the voices that will be in the show. Well, first of all, did Net- was Netflix doing original series five, six years ago? Uh, like very, very few. I mean, the studio was much yeah. smaller and they had way less money. But there was a f- – f- oh, I, I wish I could remember the, orig- the first Netflix original series. But, I mean, so, I, House of Cards was one of the early ones, right? Yeah, yes. I think that was one of the first ones, yeah. And I don't even know that, if it was five years ago, to be honest uh, with you. Yeah, it was at least four years ago, I think, four or five. I don't so know. I, I don't think the adults who are into Toys to Life, then you know, Activision, Blizzard aren't going to have to worry about those people jumping ship. If they're still on board six years later, they more than likely are going to tune in to watch this as well. But I guess the larger question is for the kids who were into Skylanders five years ago, four years ago, maybe aren't into toys anymore. Maybe they've grown up and now they're preteen or teenagers. Um, so the larger question here, is it too late? 
has this uh, ship sailed or because it's on Netflix and it has this star studded cast, it's um, it's going to do well. I mean, with the with the, the as, as soon as I saw this, I thought like, oh, this is just going to be like, uh, you know, the crappy Sonic cartoon or um, like, shovelware, you know. Oh, yeah like, yeah, like Sonic Underground or like one of the weird offshoots of Pokemon. But with that cast, with Bobcat, Coldweight, and Norm MacDonald, I'm like, are they going for like an Adult Swim higher, you know, thinkier comedy for like adults? Maybe maybe that group of kids that grew up on Skylanders are like surly teenagers now and they're trying to appeal to them. Ah, who knows? I mean, it, I'm just worried if it is a little too late because, you know, Skylanders is kind of – Lost its gleam. Uh, I think there's still some people out there that are interested, but it's not as popular in, you know, such a cultural thing as it was before. I mean, geez, you go into Walmart and go into the Skylanders area and there's parents in there with the kids going nuts, you know, and that's not so much anymore. Now it's, you know, they're easy to get. And matter of fact, there's usually an overabundance of them. So, And of course, the year that I don't decide to do Skylanders, they completely change it up and people are raving about it. And saying that the series is back on track and this whole customization thing is really what should have been there at the beginning. But the ship has sailed for me. Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens. Now, Netflix series, correct me if I'm wrong, usually they release all the content at once. Like Luke Cage, you can go out and consume it all in one day if you wanted. I don't think they've, I don't think they've ever released it any other way. Okay. So, so that's, yeah, that's I, cool. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be a big content dump. But so, so you were pretty heavy into this for a while, right, Mike? The uh, the whole Skylanders deal. Yes. Yep. What What would it take? Like, would there be anything in this show that you ever think was there any way that you would go back back to this? Um, if my kids wanted to watch it with me, probably. I mean, I would yeah. probably check out an episode. Um, just to just see out how, of curiosity. Just out of curiosity, right? Mm. But if my kids want to um, check it out, you know, we'll gladly, you know, pop it on, you know. All our TVs here are pretty much smart TVs at this point, so we can very easily get to Netflix just as we can to Cartoon Network. So, yeah. Um, now I wish my um, my youngest son was more into this stuff, but you know, with the whole speech delay thing going on, you know, we're not really sure what he's into besides Batman. So, <laughs> um, but which yeah, is not well, a bad thing to be into at all. No. Oh yeah, he is obsessed with <laughs> Batman. Let me tell you. Yeah, I'm excited. I want to hear what Hatfield has to do in the show and things like yeah. that. You know, I don't think a lot of these people are are in every episode, but I think um, some of them. I think the main people. Um, Justin Long is playing dodgeball. Oh no, Justin Long is in the was in the um, in TV dodgeball, show, yeah, in the movie, but he's playing Spyro. Um, he's Jonathan Spyro. Banks, <laughs> Jonathan Banks from Breaking Bad, is uh, Eruptor. Uh, Ashley Tisdale of High School Musical is Stealth Elf. And then we already said Norm MacDonald is Glumshanks. So it yeah, sounds I, like it's centering ju- around just a, just a few of the characters, the more popular ones from the early days. And then I think all those other people, like Bobcat, James Hetfield, they're going to be sprinkled in with some of the other characters. Well, Jonathan Banks alone would is, would make me check it out, let alone all the other characters, just because I loved his character from Breaking Bad, and I loved his character from Better Call Saul. Like, to see Mike come back like that, he's just such a badass character, and I love, love, love that guy's voice. So I, I have never cared about Skylanders, and I'm, I'm going to watch this just, just because of the casting. I at least have to check out the first episode, yeah. like you said. And the uh, executive producer, I'm not sure if this name rings any bells, it's Sandra Schwartz, uh, known from The Batman uh, I'm not sure if that's Batman movie or at Batman animated series. It just says the Batman um, animated by Team T.O. Studio. It'll be interesting to see when it comes out. So it comes out October 28th. So just a few weeks. Oh, wow. Yep. All right. So this has nice. already been taken care of. Friday, October 28th. All right. Well, let's segue over to the community question of the week, gentlemen. Uh, the question that we asked this week if you could see one comic book turned into a video game or the other way around, what would it be? Before we read these off, Corey, if you may, uh, <laughs> can you play Joe's response? Yes, let's him, let, let him go first because even though he's not here, he's definitely our resident comic book expert. Yes, and I so. think he took some sort of uh, umbrage with uh, Nick uh, Games on the Mind last week and his answer because Nick answered this question on the show last week. So I think uh, Joe has a rebuttal of sorts. Oh, I want to hear it. Oh, man. It's a good thing that 
games on the mind doesn't go by comics on the mind because he totally said that Preacher was a Dark Horse comic when it's a Vertigo comic. Oh, snap. Man, I was super mad about that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, it's Joe State, the resident comic book uh, enthusiast <laughs> slash snob. Uh, my choice for a game that should be made from a comic book property would be uh, East of West, which is this awesome comic book that's like post-apocalyptic future western and uh, it follows this really awesome – I think it's Death. He rides around on a horse. He's all white and he's super awesome and uh, he's just seeking down all these people and tearing down empires and it's really good. Anyways – Read that comic and then imagine it as a video game. Uh, I miss you guys. Bye. Oh, we, we miss you too, Joe. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe. I think we, um, I think Corey, you said he was our resident uh, comic book expert and he proclaimed that himself. So he does. So I'll, I'll give him this, even though he doesn't want it. It's legit. You got to update your <laughs> soundboard. You got to get the rare achievement in there, Corey. Come on. Didn't we hear that the other day when we were playing Horde mode? Wasn't that supposedly a rare one, and it sounded the exact same to me? Well, I listened I to the um, – Oh, no, it's different. I listened to the Major <laughs> Nelson podcast this week, and he played the the audio clip, and it sounded completely different. Maybe we didn't get a rare one the other night. Maybe that wasn't rare. Yeah. Yeah, They're we got only... a rare one. 3%. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Came up and said rare. I got the sound. So I didn't get anything. Spe- I was on PC, so I didn't get anything special. Just oh, normal, maybe the PC doesn't do it. Just a normal beep. I was on the bone. Mine sounded normal, but then again, I I really wasn't paying that much attention. And it was one thirty in the morning, so maybe I just yeah. didn't give enough of a fuck. <laughs> yeah, and when that one popped, we were a little busy in the middle of one of those waves. So I think I earned that one for doing all the. Um, but not all of them, but a good portion of the fences. I did like three or four in a row. I think it was a um, con- construction achievement. Oh, it was upgrade the fabricator all the way. That's Yeah, and was. everybody yeah. got that. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. You, you earned it for all of us. I was like in the middle of collecting cash, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. All right, let's read some of these responses. Um, majority of these are now coming from our Discord channel. I created a nice uh, question of the week. Uh, channel inside our channel so keep everything nice and organized so again that's where a majority of these are coming from uh devious mr matt of the 40 cast says comic book turned into a game the boys <laughs> i've heard him mention that comic before but i'm not a comic guy so i cannot validate if that is a good answer or not I've heard good things about that comic, but again, I don't know much about it at all either, so I wouldn't be able to comment on it. We need we need Joe for this answer. Uh, so let's see. Kel18, he started out first by saying The Witcher seems like it would be a good comic series, assuming it already isn't. And a V for Vendetta game would be cool if done right. I know that there are already books and comics. And maybe it's just because I've been playing it a lot lately, but a Diablo movie would be pretty cool. There are quite a few Diablo books. I know, like, regular straight-up novels. I've seen, there's a really? whole series of those now, yeah. Oh. I know Witcher has comics, so. Yeah, there's a ton of Witcher comics, which we corrected him in the channel, and he says, well, that invalidates my answer, but I still wanted to read his response, <laughs> give him credit for that. We still appreciate it. Yes, Robo Pig says, not a comics guy, so I will say I would read a Borderlands comic, not because it's already a cell shaded game, but because the characters are crazy and interesting. I would definitely read a Borderlands comic. I, I, like well, I have good news games. for you, gentlemen. There are Borderlands comics. Well, there's there's a couple. like uh, I think they did six. Yeah, and then they're like yeah. very short run. I don't even know if they're like multiple. I think it's like one shot. Each one is like a one shot. I remember reading yeah, one. Yeah, I'm not sure, but. I read like a digital version of it, and it wasn't that good. Like I totally forgot that it even came out. But wasn't the uh, – aren't, aren't a lot of people saying that the uh, the Telltale Borderlands games are pretty great? Yes. So uh, I fig- I figured something like that, something, something Telltale-esque, hmm. like via the writing anyway. And let's see here. We have Awaken Heathen. He says, I think a Sunset Overdrive comic series would be cool. And if it came with a punk rock sampler CD every week. All righty. That would be interesting. <laughs> uh, Indio Techno, uh, he would love to see a Destiny comics. 
more of the lore side, uh, which you don't get a lot of that in the game. So some comics that would kind of give you that stuff from the cards and whatnot would be nice. So I'd have to agree with him. If we take it back to the um, Skylanders thing real quick, Activision is also trying to make movies for Call of Duty and Destiny, I believe. So maybe the Destiny movie will be more about the lore. What the fuck would a Call of Duty movie be about? Seriously, a Call of Duty movie? Oh, I could easily see them make a movie out of the one with um, the guy from House of Cards. What was that guy's name? Kevin Spacey. Oh, Kevin Kevin Spacey, Spacey, yeah. yeah. Certainly not the one from last year because that didn't have much of a story. It felt almost like little missions. But some of these ones I think could easily translate over to a movie. Now, would they have mass appeal? I don't know. Would they turn into like movies with like wrestlers in them, you know, like the John Cena movies with (laughs) Marine or whatever? You know, I don't know. I, I think if they made a Call of Duty movie, there is a huge audience that would go see it. Like, they, it would definitely have, like, a great opening weekend. Whether or not people follow it up afterwards, I don't know. But, I mean, there's there's a massive Call of Duty following. So people would go and they would bring their Doritos on their Mountain Dew. <laughs> leave, you, leave your guns outside. <laughs> yeah. You can watch the credits if you get if you pick up a Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you prestige, uh, you get like half off the movie ticket. Yeah, prestige is if you go see the movie fifty times in a week. So there you go. All righty. So uh, Gham, uh, maybe Duke Nukem before Gr- Gearbox screwed it up would make a great comic. The humor would make it quite Deadpool esque. Uh, agreed. Uh, also, a good Watchmen game. Maybe a, a Streets or Streets of Rage influenced RPG type experience, not like that weak XBLA game that released on 360. That was a brawler, wasn't it? The uh, the XBLA game. I remember when it came out, and I thought about buying it because I was pretty into Watchmen at the time. I never even I never played, played it. it. Yeah, I think it was a tie-in with the movie, right? I don't recall. Yeah, uh, Jeremy S. Pro, uh, ex Runer Two of Dad's Getting Grounded. Uh, I want a good He-Man and the Masters of the Universe game. That yes. Is valid. That is very valid. I would play the shit out of that. Yeah, and right now, like, our generation's nostalgia is really getting mined as far as, like, uh, you know, pop culture goes with, like, you know, the the uh, recent um, Transformers game, that, like, cell shaded yeah. one, which didn't get reviewed too, too well. But if you made, like, a really good uh, He-Man game, I would be into that, especially if they use a lot of the backlog of all those characters. So many good characters. Masters I think the, the closest we got to that was um, uh, Toy Soldiers. I think you, there was a He-Man or something in there, in Skeletor <laughs> or something. Speaking of our nostalgia, uh, Corey, has it officially been a uh, jump the shark tank moment here with the uh, – Golden Girls Funkos. Oh, the Golden what? Girls Funkos? Shit. All right. I have to stop podcasting. I have to go buy myself some Golden Girls Funkos. <laughs> oh, that's not right. <laughs> I, I didn't even know those existed. Thank you for that. I'm going to give you that and that. You get both of those because I'm going to buy the shit out of those things. <laughs> oh, the first one you get is Blanche, isn't it? <laughs> hey, that's none, your, none of your damn business. <laughs> All right. So uh, next up is show enough. Shonuff71 on Twitter of Gamer Husbands Radio. Game to comic, God Hand. Post-apocalyptic world where the hero beats up corrupted midget Power Rangers and dominatrix thugs. <laughs> I'm into it. All right, uh, the next one, uh, J, a.k.a. Meef J of Everyday Gamers, at Meef J on Twitter. Uh, late to the party, but Rocket League is my video game comfort food. That was our question last time, and that is an excellent response because you can always, always sit down and play a little bit of Rocket League. And uh, comic comic to game, Lego Deadpool, which that would be cool. I think, I think the Lego games kind of lost some of their humor when they started actually putting uh, dialogue in, but... Deadpool would make fantastic dialogue, so I would uh, I would play that too. And, I don't think uh, it'd be kid friendly, though. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> but uh, the elusive man of Future Monkey says, "I have to second Indio Techno. A Destiny comic would be so amazing. There's so much lore and story locked behind the web-based viewing instead of in-game. It's unbelievable. I always wanted books, but comics would make so much more sense." And now I'm all hot and bothered thinking about it, and it's not going to happen. Cry, woohoo! 
I didn't forget to answer this week. So, yeah, I, I agree with him. When I was into Destiny, I was pretty into reading all those, like, digital cards that you could get with the uh, the companion app. And I did, why did they make it so hard to, to learn about the lore of that game? It, it always pissed me off. Yeah. So that, that I, I don't like Destiny, but I would kind of be interested in reading a Destiny comic. But All right, and the last one, um, Team 7. Oh, oh, sorry. This was um, Muerte Brutal says this. Uh, Team 7. Made into a COD Battlefield type of game because there's not enough of those. Lol. A Team 7 one would be interesting, though, I think. Fun fact, Morte Brutel is one of the original co-hosts of Gamers in Beta. Yes. From the uh, very early days. <laughs> the very first one. Hello, Tino. I don't think he listens, but hello. Ah, well, he responded. <laughs> yeah, because he's in Discord <laughs> with us. All right. Jay... Or uh, let's, let's have Corey read this. Since Corey came up with this, Corey, what is the community question for next week? All right, community question for next week in honor of Gears of War 4 and all the uh, chainsaw lancing that I've been doing lately. Best gun in any video game. What is your favorite gun? Gun specifically. I don't want any responses about swords unless it's like a gun that shoots swords. We just want a gun. So, uh, you know, it's got to go pew pew. All right. So we're going to take a break here. Um, we have an interview with Ska Studios with James and Michelle. They are a uh, husband and wife team, and they have been working on uh, Salt and Sanctuary, actually still working on it, even though the game came out in May of this year. They are still making updates to it. And, of course, you'll know them from the uh, Dishwasher Vampire games on XBLA. So we're going to play that interview now, and then we'll be back in just a little bit. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Captain Mike M. back with another uh, interview for all you folks out there. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michelle and James of Ska Studios. They're based out of the Seattle area. Um, you might know them from the XBLA days with the Dishwasher Vampire Games. And recently, in March, they released Salt and Sanctuary on PlayStation 4. And then the game was also released on PC in may is that correct yep that's right pc mac and linux even well you guys are still a uh two-person operation is that correct yep we are although although, (laughs) now we're now we're actually contracting out stuff so Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah we um we hired an awesome dude ethan lee to do our mac and linux ports actually and yeah yeah, i was gonna say hence the mac and linux (laughs) ports (laughs) because yeah i don't i don't know if i if i would have the uh the, the tenacity to to get that done myself <laughs> i think you know i think dean uh, when he was working on dust and elysian tail he did all that himself because at some point he like sent me a mac or no maybe i think actually ethan did do it but he sent me like a mac binary and he's like hey you have a mac right can you see if this works <laughs> you know oh well awesome well we i think uh had you on the show last I want to say November, December of 2014, right before the holidays. And um, so this was probably the early days of Salt and Sanctuary. I'm not sure if you had a title for the name uh, for the game then, but a lot has changed. I'm not sure either. Yeah, I don't. We might have been still calling it Project Tower. I'm not. <laughs> I don't remember right, when we gave it a title. Right. It's still. It's still. Pro- it'll always be Project Tower in the Visual Studio it solution. It will be. <laughs> I know. For a while, we were just going to call it Salt, but you know, it, it worked out because we we, we uh, you know we extended the name, and then uh, it, it turned out there was another Steam game called Salt that was sort of like uh, um, trying to be in the vein of, of Rust, I think, like you know a um, a survival, like a nautical themed or an island themed survival game. So the game is uh, being very well received. I'm looked on uh, Metacritic, and you're right around the 84 mark, and okay. on um, Steam. The recent and overall reviews are listed there as very positive, so that is awesome. So why don't you tell people out there, you know, either one of you, um, you know, what the game is? You know, what is Salt and Sanctuary? So the the, the quickest way to to uh, to pitch it is it's it's two D Dark Souls. Uh, you know, the the more elaborate pitch is that you know it takes a lot of a lot of RPG action, brawling combat elements of you know Castlevanias, and um, I, I feel like like the combat from from Dishwasher, which was inspired by the combat from Devil May Cry. Um, I feel like like that. I I 
I, I, we, we made a pretty strong show of that, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of like giving it that brawler feel instead of as opposed to um, you know, the, the strict Castlevania feel of uh, of like if you touch something, it hurts you. You know, and we have we have combos, we have we have air juggles, that kind of stuff. But it's still it, it, we, we want to keep it um, or retain an amount of, of like a heavy feel, like a heavy, heavy souls feel. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we really, it was, it was like an experiment to see if, if, um, if souls mechanics that, that, you know, I, I personally just became obsessed with, uh, if they would carry over to a 2d game, like it began as this experiment. And, uh, and as we, as we worked on it, uh, everyone that we showed was like, was like this, you're onto something here. This is, this is pretty, pretty excellent. Um, now were you playing souls at the time? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Once, once, like, once I got Dark Souls, because like at first I didn't quite get it. You know, and everyone there's a while where where people are like, you, like you like, you know, they they because um, I, mean, I mean, playing dishwasher, dishwasher is a very, uh, very, very difficult, you know, tough but fair style of game. And um, uh, you know, so our, our our Twitter our Twitter friends and fans, um, you know, they would be telling me like like, dude, Dark Souls, play Dark Souls, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, it's just you know, it's fantasy RPG, but it's super hard. And I, I, you know, I started it, and I was like, yep, sure enough, you know, it's just it's a lot of a lot of you know, getting getting cheesed, getting getting stun locked, you know, yeah, whatever. And then like once once all of the mechanics started to click, I was just I was just uh, it just it blew me away, you know, and and I've just been in love with it ever since. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I like waiting for dark souls two to come out. I got demon souls and then like, just play the hell out of dark souls two, even though everyone hates that one. Uh, and then <laughs> you know, bloodborne and three bloodborne is like, it's the only game I've ever platinumed on, 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 um, PlayStation, including ours, because I, I've played it so much <laughs> in development and, and, you know, I, um, on, on steam that like when it came out, I didn't, I, I, I've never actually gotten around to, to platinum me but I, I platinumed bloodborne and i loved every second of it bloodborne was an amazing game i think not only just the the lore and the mechanics but just a beautiful looking game piece of artwork in my opinion yeah yeah, oh, yeah. We, we got to meet the director of uh <laughs> yeah. in in kyoto um uh hidetaka miyazaki we got to we got to meet him and um and a, a couple other uh, um uh folks that worked at sony japan uh, on on the Bloodborne, like Team Japan, Sony Japan, Bloodborne. Um, I'm I'm not sure exactly where their where their roles were, right. uh, but uh, but the the marketing guy um, Kitao San, I forgot what I forgot what his first name, is, but it's Kitao uh, is is uh, is his, is his Twitter name. Uh, he was a big Salt fan, so it was like this, this like this absolute geeking out of you know like oh my gosh you're the, you know, you're, <laughs> you're the Bloodborne guy and the, you know he he's uh, he he probably didn't uh, uh, geek out quite as badly as I did. <laughs> so it was like a form uh, of acceptance. Basically, it was good you know um, confirmation yeah, that you no, did it, something good that you heard from someone who made a game that you look up to. Said hey, I really yeah. enjoyed your game as well. Yeah, it was it was just it was like a special like a like a career. Yeah, it was a huge affirmation. It was great. <laughs> right, right. Like a like a moment you'll never forget. It was, it was so special. I mean, because you know, like like uh, there, there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, I, I I don't like you know going to E3 and stuff. You don't you don't meet a lot of a lot of Eastern developers. It's mostly you know mostly Western developers. And even then, I mean, you, you, it's not often you see like a developer rock star from anywhere very often um so just like seeing the 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 souls director just in the flesh right there and i i don't speak enough japanese i don't i basically speak no japanese and he didn't speak english but um you know through through uh it's like it, it, they said he liked it <laughs> through <laughs> through uh through a bit of um you know translation awesome. uh which which was just the most like heartwarming moment <laughs> you know it's just it was just uh like like uh, what's that called? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The um, uh, what's the actualiz- self actualization kind of right. like it's just this this like life goal of uh, of getting that kind of kind of acceptance. So yeah, that was that was special. <laughs> now have That's you found team. that players are also so people that have played Bloodborne and Souls and Castlevania have also gravitated towards your game? Yeah, I think that's the the major uh, niche there of kind of the kind of games people like to play there um we actually started first getting known for salt and sanctuary through um the youtuber uh, vati vidya or vati vidya yeah <laughs> um and then that kind of spread to other content creators 
And at E3, um, oh man, the, the E3 before last E3, yeah, time. Um, mm-hmm. This group of like streamers and YouTubers came over to us. They were they were there for the Dark Souls Three event, and they came over and like they heard Salt and Sanctuary was going to be there, and they came over in this big group, and we got to know them and kind of spread the word through those guys. And I really think that's a huge part of how Salt the word got spread, really. Um, and that, that seems to be the way it goes these days with, um, like, streamers and YouTubers. Um, yeah, it really seems to be the way to spread the word. Yeah, definitely, word, you know, word of mouth. I mean, not a, a lot of people are picking up the magazines these days or going to... Not spend, a lot of magazines these days either. <laughs> yeah, or mm-hmm. people just even going to websites, I mean, to read, like, articles. I mean, I don't know, that's a... Just a whole nother um, podcast, right? That you could have on people not reading anymore and and, and just <laughs> just yeah. watching stuff. But we won't go down that. But certainly, you are correct. That's how a lot of people are aware of new games. Um, so, what's it like making games uh, in two thousand fourteen through sixteen? When we had you on last, James, um, it was pretty much right at the end of your um, days with XBLA. You had some um, strong opinions on how that played out. <laughs> two, year, yeah. two years I later, do you, do you still have those opinions? Has it uh, softened at all, or and how was the you know working with PlayStation? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm, you know, I, I kind of wonder what I <laughs> what I, I, pro- I probably know exactly what I said. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's see. I, I know. Um, I know. I, I was I was upset about you know just them them shelving X and A and and right. uh, yes. Um, well, so it's it's really interesting Be, since that you know X and A was was this you know Microsoft proprietary thing and and um, and Mono Game is just basically an open source uh, functionally it's it's a, it's a functionally identical uh, but but open source implementation of all of the all of the X and A you know calls and, and functions and whatever uh, and so we're using Mono Game to basically to make. X and A code run on uh, on on PlayStation Four, you know. So so, you know, Microsoft has nothing to do with that, and, and uh, it's really nice that we can have that all running. Um, you know, of course, I'm 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 still bitter about them just canceling X and A so quickly. And then now the weirdness of it all is that Microsoft is now going to the open source guys. So basically, Monogame rescued X and A, and it was like, all right, the community is going to keep this going even though Microsoft has abandoned it. Microsoft now wants all of those developers back on xbox one so they're going to the community that continued you know that 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 um that kept xna breathing as mono game and saying we're going to use mono game to get that code running on xbox one now so it's this, it's like this total you know like like just this, this bizarre circle of like of like create a thing throw it away someone else gets it and then you go and or you know someone else fixes it and then you're like oh i want that fixed thing the you know that I that I created and threw away. Uh, so now we'll, we'll be able to get um, our code running on uh, on Xbox One. And the question is now, like, are we are we actually going to do it? Um, you know, we haven't announced that we will or we won't. You know, um, I think I think I'd like to. Uh, you know, I mean, part of me it just it feels kind of just kind of kind of kind of weird, kind of lame to be like, all right, you know, here's the game like a year later, and you know. I, I get that people have been playing it on PC and PS4, but hey, Xbox players, now you can, now you can partake, you know, you know, and you either do that or you add, you add, you know, you make do something to make it make it like a special whatever Xbox One edition. But then you piss off the PS4 and the Steam people that that uh, you know they they want to get the Xbox One stuff. That's not, you know, and, and um, it's. Uh, yeah. It's it's hard it's to you can't please slope, everyone. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't please everyone. And that's like the whole Yeah, I guess you know. end of the day you can't make everybody happy, but you know, you try you try your best. And it would be cool to get it on Xbox One, but that's just a there's a few things that we need yeah. to wait for to happen. And we don't really have that much of like an ongoing dialogue with Microsoft right now. We Yeah, it's not we used to have like a really good open like open dialogue when well, back when we had um there was a like a direct project manager to talk to over at Microsoft, and it was really easy to get in contact with them. And now it seems to be like a lot less open. It's a lot, maybe more difficult to keep, well, that, keep that open. That you know, I think Microsoft is is going the the route of um, of Sony, where Sony is like they basically give you everything you need to just you know submit a game, 
put it through put it through cert uh and and publish it like pretty much all of that stuff you could just do on your own and when we worked with microsoft um it was it was totally the other way. Microsoft was was our was our publisher, so Microsoft was taking care of all of the all of the certification, all of the QA, all of the localization, and really all we had to do was just uh, just send them builds. You know, <laughs> like we were working with a with a producer. The producer would, would tell us what we needed to do, give us a list of things to fix. We would fix them, and you know, send out a new build, see how close it is to the to the uh, the, the goal, and you know, either either send it to cert or or keep trying. <laughs> you know, and it was a lot of months of of just iterating and um but you know it was it was like that whereas with, with sony it's just it's totally um you know to, totally it, it feels kind of like a like a free for all you know you, you can you can work on your game you can you can try to finish it whenever you can not try to finish it whenever i mean it, it's on you to take care of all of the uh all of the you know cert look all that qa all that kind of stuff um scheduling uh scheduling uh for for cert um, you know, scheduling for for release, all of that stuff is is on you, and it's kind of for me, it's it's kind of a, an overwhelming amount of freedom. Um, but <laughs> we, you know, we 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 got there in the end. We ended up working a lot with um, with our account rep at Sony toward the end. Um, but you know, I mean, they they like to leave it as hands off as possible because their their impression is that indies don't like being told what to do. Now, I I'm uh, I'm I'm kind of of the type of of uh, of mindset mentality where uh, uh, if, if I have unlimited freedom, I might just like watch TV all day or something. You know, it's, it's like I'm I'm uh, you know if, if I'm if I'm like motivated, I'll I'll start getting stuff done, and then eventually uh, I get in this in this mode where you just kind of have to put a gun to my head, <laughs> you know, and. Um, so, so with Saul, while we were working with, with Sony, um, what ended up happening was I, I think I, I just kind of let the project just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually we were uh, – what, what really lit a fire under us was uh, Dark Souls 3 coming out and, um, and a Sony uh, promotion that was, um, that, was, that was coming up. So we got offered a chance to be in the promotion, and, uh, which would actually would put us right near when Dark Souls 3 would come out. Uh, and then, and it, it even it seemed at that time like that would be too 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 long, like one to launch earlier. And then when it, it started, it, it became time to like get things all set up and in order. It became apparent that we had to really really scramble just to just to meet the you know just just to beat Dark Souls three to launch because we, we wanted to come out you know when when the hype was was up there and it's like everyone wants to play something Souls like you know everyone's just like maximum hype for Dark Souls. And it's like okay hey how about a two D Dark Souls you know. How about how about um, you know a little a little uh, something to you know just to just to just to scratch that itch like we'll be there for you <laughs> uh, you know and the, and the act, actual or the, the absolute um, you know worst scenario is if we launched like a month after Dark Souls and and uh, you know then then it's like everyone's like like why, why would I play that I'm playing Dark Souls <laughs> you know yeah you're gonna try to ride out that wave. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we really had to scramble at the end, and and uh, you know, it probably would have been nice if someone was was pushing us along the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, I mean, that you know, then it might have been a, a much shorter game. Like it ended up just this really, I mean, for us, like just the, this this massive game. Just so much, so much was was in it. So much was to it. Mm-hmm. And um, well, uh, t- yeah, I mean. It's it's like any game development thing. You you end up with like, you know, some regrets, a lot of stuff you're proud of, a lot of stuff you would have done a little bit differently, and and uh, uh, yeah, you just you, you kind of end up saying like that 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 happened, <laughs> and we're we're still here. I'm curious what will happen with PlayStation. Um, you know, spe- specifically the indie stuff now that um, Adam Boys has moved on. Oh yeah, yeah. Adam Boys and uh, and Nick Sutner. He was our he was our uh, account rep. Was uh, Nick Sutner? They. Um, oh yeah, Adam's at Iron Galaxy now. Right. I don't really I don't really know him aside from you know I've I've like been introduced, um, but uh, but Nick we worked with pretty closely and Nick moved over to Oculus, and uh, you know what happened like in in like indie circles when Nick and Adam both left and like the same it was like it was like the same two week period um everyone was just like oh man is sony gonna shut down their indies like what's happening here and and uh you know i i told told nick about that and he said the only reason he felt comfortable with with moving on because you know he'd, he'd want like he he 
he really was instrumental in, in building up the, the Sony's uh, indie indie platform, and and he he told me that the only reason he felt comfortable moving on was because the indie platform was in such good shape. Like he he built it, he got it stable, he got it he got it working and running, and you know it's it's a it's a it's a system that doesn't need major tweaking now. It's it's in a good place, and because he was confident at where it was, then he felt comfortable in, in moving on. So that was you know that that was that was nice to hear. Um, I mean, not, not like, so. and then once he said Oculus and Parma Lucky goes off and does what what he does, I wonder how much that's it. He was like, I wish I was at PlayStation still. So I don't have to <laughs> deal with this crap. But let's <laughs> um, let's talk about Salt and Sanctuary some more. Um, certainly, as a father of three young boys, um, they love creating characters. So, oh. not that I was letting them play this game because you know. There's some violence to this, you know. I'm sure my 11 sure. year old could handle it, you know, reasonably well. But my three year old might be pushing, <laughs> might be pushing it. But um, all three of them love to create characters, and uh, I enjoyed that as well in your game. Uh, I guess the first question I was asked: Do you guys get um, like access to stats? Can you see like what the most uh, popular combinations are? That would be fascinating to me. Oh, as a developer. you know, if we if I set it up, <laughs> it's a good that's a good idea for the future. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe not for this, but if we do another game in this in this vein, yeah, uh, that would be I mean, interesting to see. Um, kind of unrelated, but a little bit related. We were at Steam Dev Days um, this last week, and there was a, a talk about psychology in games, and usually the most common we use character is the default. Like most people go toward the default. So sure. numbers wise, probably whatever the default character that pops up is. But yeah, I'd be interested to see what people like when people do change from default, what they change to yeah. and what, what kind of character they make. You know, I certainly, you know, from a, you know, the podcast perspective here, I'm always looking at the stats, where are people coming in from, where are we getting the most listeners from, what days and things like that. So I can only imagine the stuff that you could go looking at this, you know, people, are people from, you know, from Europe, do they like blue hair and yeah. th this, you know, <laughs> skin color, you know, I would just go not to spend all day doing that type of stuff. Um, yeah, that, yeah. The character creation was uh, th that was that was one of those things that I was I was really curious to see how it would work in uh, you know in, in our in our two D skeletal character animation engine, and um, you know like there's I, I think all the, like the super colorful beard and hair combinations they 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 look the worst. <laughs> but, yeah. Like, yeah, I would but, I agree uh, with that. You know, I, I I think I went with the dark, the, the silverish. Not the silver, maybe grayish black hair. I forget what that's called now. I should have wrote it down, but I think that's what I went with. The, the color, you're right, the green and the reds with the beard <laughs> looked a little yeah. too, too. Was a little too much. Yeah, when I see when I watch people play with it, they they it depends on the kind of person. But if they're doing a serious playthrough, then you get more natural natural colors. But if it's someone who's like played it over and over again, you get like the silly, like let's screw up this guy's face as much as we can. Kind Let's of mentality. Make the prodigy. <laughs> my, yeah. yeah. I had a very serious look for my character, but then I went over some sort of region, and it was the one that you know, sort of Dracula or something, you know, with the the red eyes and the fangs and maybe gray yeah. face. And so nice. everything else is very serious except the those facial features. But yeah, same thing with souls. Really, like you can make your character look so ridiculous. I think I have a character that's. Um, in Bloodborne that is entirely blue and her name is Fish Sticks. Um, so that's like my silly character. Um, she ended up being my main though. Like I went back to her and played her more. Um, but yeah, that was kind of funny. So with those, some good conversations now for, for people out there that don't know you are husband and wife. Um, is those some good conversations when you came up with the names some good arguments back and forth. No, this should be this. We should call this something like this. When you come up with all the the hairstyles and the colors, I mean, certainly red is red, but you you did have different names. Michelle in did all the. I think yeah. I just named like James. Kind of had some place, you know, some basic ones in place, and then I went in yeah, and like just, like red, orange, yellow, and then Michelle. Yeah, I went and tweaked and then renamed things. I think you renamed a few of the hairstyles too, but like there wasn't really a whole lot of argument about it. Like right. I just did. I did some renaming and tweaking and coming up with um, the kinds of colors you can get. Yeah, 
It was just a lot of just um, putting stuff in there <laughs> and then changing it, and then there it is. Now, you guys are still supporting this game. I see that um, you have a public beta branch out on the uh, PC on Steam. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was to... sort of a, a strange. <laughs> I mean, well, what happened was we had to kind of. I mean, it was basically we had to we had to put out a fire. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So Steam, it's 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 an interesting new thing for us, and um, you know we've done nothing but Xbox 360 games in the past, and um, uh, we have uh, so so there's this mechanic where you know if you if you die in the game. Um, you die in real life. No, I'm just kidding. If you die in the game, uh, uh, it uploads it uploads your uh, your like your your loadout, like your your um you know your your character creation stuff, like your you know your hair, beard, hair color, beard color, origin, um, eye color, uh, and then all the equipment that you're currently wearing, you know your your armor, sword, shield, whatever, uh, uploads all that to to a server, and uh, also it, it uploads like um, like a few snapshots of of like where you were before you died and you know then it, it, it as you're playing it'll be pulling this data down from the servers um and uh it's like the, the that those data will be used to create tombstones where if you hit a tombstone it, it shows you know the the like little echo of of uh, of the death sequence i mean just totally totally a, a a soul's a soul's experience right uh so it shows you know the echo of, of when he died uh but it also uses that data to um to show, like, anytime you see someone, like, hanging from a tree or... I mean, that, that's the most typical one is, is the hanged bodies. But there's, there's, other, there's other ways they're dead. Like, you'll, you'll see them in the, in the cages, in the Red Hall of Cages. And um, uh, you also... Actually, in, the, um, in Pitchwoods, there's, there's corpses that are... Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a thing in that about, about the execution method of being bound and scattered, which is where they, which is where they, they bind your arms in, in little wood things and just bash your brains out. Um, and that's what those there there are witches in there that that, that are uh, killed by that execution method. Um, but uh, so you know we have the, we have this mechanic, and um, uh, I still I still don't know entirely um, exactly what happened, but through through some like you know sleuthing and uh, working with people who had the issue on the forums, uh, we were able to determine that basically someone somehow was uh, was. I think I mean like my 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 working assumption is someone was was modding the game somehow like it would basically what they would have done would have been uh, you know decompiling and recompiling it. like like against it would it would go against the terms of service but we're not really we're not we're not going to go witch hunting or anything um, but what what could have happened uh, is you know say if someone was like I want to add a new beard. And like I don't know how many beards in the game. So there's like ten beards in the game. They're like I'm gonna add you know beard number eleven. It's gonna be like a a nice like like braided braided Viking beard. It'll be great, <laughs> you know. So they like they they go into the code and they add they add beard number eleven, uh, and then you know and then they're playing. They die. It uploads to the server. Like you know you died. This is what you look like. You had beard number eleven. Uh, you know, and then that's that, right? And then someone's playing, and they get to an area near where you died. The server pulls down. Someone died here. They had beard number eleven, and uh, because, like, in development, I, you know, that it never would have come up that that a, a a beard number eleven would have existed. So I didn't have any code to check that the beard number coming down was was within bounds of a. Uh, of the the drawable beards, so uh, you know then like without without that that safe safe checking code in there, if it tried to render a dead character who had beard number eleven, and uh, you have an unmodded copy that only has beards one through ten, uh, it'll it would just crash, and uh, and so so that was that was the the fire that we had to put out. You know, it's just like we had this Facebook message where this, you know someone's like someone's like you have to get your you have to get your uh, your act together. You know, the game just crashes all the time. Like, why don't you fix these? You know, and we're just like, okay, crap. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean the the amount of the amount of sleuthing <laughs> that you have to do, and like and like the 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 absence of information. It's just like the game crashes all the time, and you're like, why does it crash? And they're just like. Oh, it crashes in this spot, and it's like, can you send me a crash log? And then they just go silent, or you know. <laughs> but eventually, we got crash log, and all I needed was a crash log, and then that was exactly what it what pointed me to the issue. And like, I haven't heard anything about it since, so you know, hopefully, hopefully, we got that. Um, but because of how Steam is set up, and because of how 
poor I am at using Steam <laughs> uh, for you know for the the, the deployment stuff. Uh, we had a branch that we're using for testing localization, and um, and we basically like because uh, because I I don't have like the code on my computer. Um, forked into like i don't have like a low specific branch and then like a like a quick fix specific branch so because i had to do a quick fix i basically rolled in all the all the beta look and then started a new uh so that like there, there's a new beta um that's i don't know if, what what it adds versus the standard uh side but um um you know basically we had to we had to take that that beta thing fix the issue push it live and, and and kind of like establish a new a new system where there's always a public beta that you can try out and then you know the there's there's just like the the, the base build uh so that was that was like a little bit of a little bit of a panicked moment you know when when that thing came up because yeah it was a little bit of a rush decision and i at first i was trying to like let's collect beta testers and see who wants to beta test and then at some point um james was saying hey why don't we just put it live for everybody because you can have a beta branch like that and just say opt into it if that's what you want to check out and if you want to help us out do that because um other games do that um i can't think of an example you were well i was saying fallout 4, fallout 4 does it yeah when i was playing fallout 4 they made like a, a, i mean that's a bigger game with a lot more people working on it to support sure. it but um yeah it seemed like it was a quick decision but it seemed to be good and no one really said hey I'll say you know who else branch. does that? Hmm? Steam. Well, oh yeah, Steam in general. Steam does right? that. Steam yeah, does you, can, it. <laughs> you can switch to the Steam beta branch, and that's that's no big deal. Now, could you have gone to Steam and said, "Hey, this someone's modding our game," or is it incumbent upon you to make sure your code is locked down, that no one can mod it? I don't. Think I think we it's could individual. Ever, yeah, I don't think we could ever make it that no one could mod it. I mean, right. that's that's just the nature of it. Sure. Um, but you know, we, we we don't have any official support uh, for it, so that's it's kind of you know it's just it's an at your own risk kind of thing, and you know I mean that's that's just that's just it is what it is. <laughs> so now that you have this public beta branch, are you taking any sort of like, like hey this is an opportunity to try out new things, or are you just putting out fires? Just putting out fires. At, yeah, at the moment <laughs> just putting out fires, but um... yeah. So the game is pretty much in your in your mind, the game is pretty much done. You don't, you don't see yourself adding anything to it or making any updates. It's just bug fixing at this point. Yeah, yeah bug fixing and, and uh, bug, look. Bug fixing bug at this it. point. Um, yeah, look, we're working on um, uh, Chinese and Korean next. And once we get that in, we're just hoping to start working on the next game as soon as we sure. can. But it's it's been difficult with this game needs so much more support than we've had to do before. Um, especially with being in so many regions this time and different platforms this time, and there's still only two of us, so oh, yeah. we're doing the best we can. Careful uh, but what it you asked for, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be great to start working creatively again. Would you say that the, that that has been the biggest hurdle that you guys have overcome with this project? Is just being the two of you, and it's on multiple platforms in different regions, or was there early day stuff? I think when we talked last, you guys created your own. Uh, tools and in-game engine, right? You guys are. Did oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're still working yeah. on the same tools, and and every every game, James kind of tweaks the tools and makes them a little better each time, and um, that that part of it is pretty uh, streamlined now. So it's really great that we can still use those tools um, with Mono Game working now for us. Um, but the challenge like the biggest challenge was just the surprise of what you have to do when you're self-publishing and, and not getting that Microsoft support mm-hmm. anymore, um, being first party published back then. Um, I think we still would prefer to do it the way we're doing it with, um, yeah, yeah. We like the, be able to self-publish, but it was just a, a shock at first to like, Oh man, there's all this stuff we have to do. And no one's telling us, um, Hey, let's have a, a triage and, have a meeting can certainly relate to that you know as i mentioned and i don't expect you guys to remember our conversation from two years ago but <laughs> uh you know as a musician you know certainly i was in signed bands and you know tours were taken care of promotion was taken care of and then what the music industry has crashed right so now everybody <laughs> sort of publishes makes their own music and puts them on itunes and now you had to say sure so some I had some like intern probably taking care of you know promotional posters. Now I got to figure out how to do that, you know. So <laughs> can certainly relate to uh, how that all shakes out. Um, sure. Is there any sort of exciting you know when we talk to community people that when we ask them about you know 
when I talk to developer X, Y, and Z, what do you guys want to hear about? And they always like to hear about stuff that didn't make it into the game and why. Is there any sort of exciting stuff that, that you felt, that, oh, I wish we had more time, we could have got this in, it could have been really cool, or this was funny, any sort of antidote like that? <laughs> I, I know the one thing that, um, you know, I, everyone's asked for it, and I and we really wanted to do it, but it was it was it was there, there were so many uncertainties with, um, uh, you know, especially with with moving to PlayStation. But that was uh, online online multiplayer. Um, with uh, with Xbox 360, it was all it was all pretty exposed and pretty pretty robust. Um, but with PS4, because because of uh, you know Mono Game is a, it's a community driven project. Uh, Mono Game didn't have any any online stuff exposed. Um, and, uh, and also we, uh, you know, with just the amount of work that, that went into making the game as is, uh, like if we, if we actually got some kind of online multiplayer going, it, you know, it, it assuredly would have been like just another year and it would have invited so many issues, <laughs> so many problems. So, you know, I mean, like it, it is what it, like, I, I, I wish we could have, I wish we could have had, uh, you know online multiplayer somehow but at the same time i I kind of i'm like relieved that we don't (laughs) because uh it it would it would be an ongoing nightmare especially now with with multiple platforms i mean we've um just just dealing with one platform with xbox 360 like i i I never got good at doing online multiplayer and you know everyone's just like you should have hired someone and maybe for the next one we will you know but like um uh, I, I always I, I like implementing it. I'm not very good at implementing it, and I really wish I could have done it with Salt. But I'm also at the same time I'm, I'm relieved that we didn't because uh, that I, that would be what I would be doing right now. Would be like putting out fires related to multiplayer. Yeah, it would have uh, taken so much longer. Like we knew with Charlie Murder, um, we knew exactly how much longer it took double the time to just to get multiplayer in and it still wasn't, it wasn't really good. great <laughs> like it worked for some people but for a lot of people it it just did not work very well so that is something that we're probably not going to add that online multiplayer um for this game but the next one we have we at least have that experience now of like hey this is what happens <laughs> you know yeah. Oh, and then with PC, we'd have to deal with hackers, too. Which even, like, you know, Souls games, I don't think they've ever really dealt with hackers well, you know? <laughs> now, certainly, um, in talking to you guys, I get a sense that you have fond memories of, of the 360 days and certainly proud of those games. <laughs> um, backwards compatibility is a thing now with the Xbox One. I think when we talked last, that was not a thing. It wasn't on anybody's radar, at least wasn't on mine. So it exists. Um I think some uh-huh. people who are fans of fans of you guys could env- envision a world where you bring salt over and you give people, hey, you buy salt, you might get a Charlie Murder, you might get a dishwasher game. Um, any of any of those uh, ideas in your brain? Has anybody talked to you, approached you about stuff like that? Uh, so our games won't work with back compat. <laughs> yeah, we we were yeah. trying to ask about that for a while without really much answer and. I I still not sure if there was a distinct answer, but we got the impression that XNA got, is just not well. You know, XNA even with Mono Game is not going to work with their backwards compatibility. It could it can be released on Xbox One now, but it would have to be a re-release. It would have to be go through the whole process. Of, yeah, we'd have to we'd have to rebuild re, it, rebuilding it, and re- going through cert and everything. So it would have to be. Yeah, it would. It would it wouldn't just work, and I'm yeah. I'm guessing online multiplayer certainly wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, but I know when I yeah. play some of those games, it's still the 360 interface that you go to, like the night before uh, um, Gears came out, right? Gears Four. Some mm-hmm. of my friends wanted to boot up uh, Gears Three and run through Horde mode, so we were had a little practice ahead of time. And you know, you still go into the 360 interface, like you do when you go to party chat and stuff like that. You're pulling up the 360. <laughs> Um, so that's why I was curious if your games would, you know, run because it's you're actually not. While you're yes, you're on your Xbox One and using an Xbox One controller. It's really the look and feel of everything is the 360. Hmm. That's uh. As I haven't haven't tried it all. We actually just fired up our Xbox One again because we were gonna play some Gears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the new Gears. Yep. It is good. I heard. Uh, <laughs> So we had some uh, community questions here that we'll uh, probably end off with. Um, of course, you know, you're the typical community questions, right? So someone wants to know, would there be a sequel to Salt and Sanctuary? Um, we can't say definitively, but that would that's on our 
our thoughts. <laughs> okay. And then the other thing is, uh, I think we already know the answer to this. So people asking when it's going to come to the Vita. Um, now you have okay. another, you've outsourced this, right? Someone else is doing that yeah, for you? Yeah, so uh, it's actually the, the project lead of Mono Game. Uh, um, Tom Spillman of, uh, of his, his studio is called Sickhead Games. Um, and Sickhead Games did the PS4 and Vita port for Darkest Dungeons was their, was the most recent um, effort by by Sickhead, basically by Tom. Uh, and he's he's working on our Vita port. I've actually like I've I've played. He sent me a build and I I got it deployed and I played it. Um, and it's you know it's got some some performance stuff that <laughs> that needs to be uh, that needs to be worked on. Um, but it was it was just it was kind of just you know remarkable just seeing it seeing it playing there and and you know everything everything just looked exactly as it did on ps4 uh which is actually going to be a you know that's going to be a thing we're going to have to work on because uh you know we're going to have to strip some stuff out not nothing nothing content wise but i mean stuff like like you know map like um uh, blood staining the map uh that's like a super expensive shader because i'm bad at programming uh, so like, like that kind of thing, uh, you know, like stuff you can, stuff you can strip out that it won't affect really. I mean, it shouldn't affect anything substantial, um, just to, just to up the performance a little bit. And then he's doing like, I, I think he's doing just all this crazy low level, uh, performance profiling just to, just to get the engine sped up. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, he's, he's confident <laughs> i'm uh i'm just like i'm like hey if you can do this more power to you um because i i had some issues getting the performance just uh just getting to a point where it was it was running fine on ps4 in the first place. ps4 that's i mean compared to vita ps4 is a beast um but uh uh he's he seems confident that it'll happen so like <laughs> yeah we're not yeah. entirely sure when a release date would be um i know it's going to be at least december or later we don't have like a a strict timeline on that um and we basically don't even want to say if there is a timeline um oh yeah definitely there, i mean there isn't one but we don't really want to say promise anything because that makes people mad too when there's no when it's not out when we promised because yeah <laughs> again it's one of those like can't win situations like either yeah yeah the i mean the, the reason it happened was uh we i mean you know if, if i could go back and just like um, not uh, not not promised to do Vita. It, it, I probably would have, uh, but we promised it, so we're gonna follow through. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, what, what happened was we were we were you know applying for um, for a Sony Pub Fund, and um, and the, you know this is like kind of like the contract negotiation process. So, so Sony Pub Fund is basically they, they they guarantee you like a minimum amount of sales. So it's it's like insurance against the game tanking because that's that's the thing about game development. Is you spend like you spend like two three years working on the game, and uh, there is like the chance that all of that time will just be wasted because you won't make any money in sales is far, far greater than the odds of the game doing well, if you think about it, you know? Um, like, so many so many games are, are financial failures, especially from small teams. Like, the vast majority of, of games from small teams are, are, you know, are financial failures. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you don't hear about it much because all just the, the, the bigger games, they always rise to the top, and then that's what you see. But you don't see, you know, the other, the other several. Like, for every game that succeeds, you don't see the other several dozen projects where it's, you know, I mean maybe it was new and experienced people maybe they just didn't get the get the word out you know uh who knows what went wrong <laughs> but <laughs> well even if your game is successful then people want it free from you know ps plus oh, or right? oh yeah, they want to wait yeah, for yeah. Free. yeah yeah or yeah i mean there was a studio where their game launched um actually they're based out of boston uh um uh what was the it was um slam bolt scrappers launched right in the middle of of ps3's like Two month long outage. Remember when PS3 had that major yes. hacking yep. issue? Yeah. They, so that was their that was their launch day. It was like right in the middle of that outage, and uh, uh, yeah, good luck yeah. with that, right? You yeah, know, you that, can't you can't redo your launch day. It sucks a lot. <laughs> yeah. No. So so uh, so pub fund um, is just this great idea where it's like you know. I mean, so for for the way I see it, for a company like Sony to to fund like a studio of our size for the amount of time it takes us 
to to make you know to make salt like it's not that much for them it's it's not it's not a lot of not a lot of risk um and uh, and then for us it's just like it's like oh fantastic because then when the if the game if the game launches in the middle of you know in the middle of an outage or if the game launches and just everyone doesn't care about it at that point or you know i mean who, again who knows what could go wrong uh you know then we still don't have to like you know lose our house or, or, <laughs> or whatever so it's it's a really it's a really nice insurance thing uh an insurance policy and um but yeah so so when we were doing that um they they uh they, they kind of said well hey if you if you you know promise to do it on vita and and the middleware to get it on vita it's not done now but it it will be by the time i mean it probably will be by the time you're done uh that would that would really you know make a much stronger case for for being accepted for uh for pub fund um so you know we we were like yeah sure and then what happened was by the time the game was was ready to launch the middleware was was not quite done um so, uh, so that's you know, and that's just that's just what happened. I mean, it's like, it, Sony thought it would be ready. Uh, Tom thought it would be ready, uh, and it wasn't ready. And, you know, even even if it was ready, I, I uh, like if we had to actually do all the, I mean, it would have to it would uh, have to have been ready for for like a year before launch to actually get all the performance straightened out for me anyway. So. Um, it just the way it happened is is was like that, and you know we we, we pissed off a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, you know, they they felt that we 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 misrepresented our product and we lied to them, and you know it's just, I mean, these things happen, and uh, and and when uh, when you you end up getting some really really nasty insults as a as a response, uh, it it hurts a lot because <laughs> they can hide behind their keyboard. There's no repercussions. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, at, at the same time, it's like I I understand where their where their anger is coming from, but um, you know, that's uh, like like that, that that's just you know, it's it's my message is like you know we we all we all thought it would work and it didn't, and like yelling at people isn't going to speed anything up, <laughs> but it but you know we're we're making every effort to to fix it. Um, and then the next logical question: once you do get it released, when's it coming to VR? <laughs> I know, right? What would it even? That's that's just, that's such a like. So so part of me like, kind of secretly hopes that VR is a fad, like like we, <laughs> just because that's just it's VR is totally incompatible with the type of games we make. <laughs> so it's such it's such a selfish selfish idea for me because VR is really really special. Um, I think uh, like like so so Tim Sweeney's uh, you know little little talk at, at Dev Days where he was talking about to get it looking right, you're going to need 8K per eye. Uh, that's a ways off. <laughs> oh man, I saw. I just saw an ad today for a VR roller coaster, like a real roller coaster that they oh, put. Yeah, that... They put these Samsungs on your face that you're on the roller coaster, and I'm just thinking, roller coasters already make me a little bit barfy, but that would just ruin <laughs> no. me. That would just. So wreck I've my heard stomach. about. Supposedly, it's like it's one of the the like the the lighter like the most underwhelming roller coasters. But you put the VR on it, and now you, all this special stuff is happening around you, and that 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 changes it, you know. Yeah, I get but. seasick in the shower, so I'm not. Um, <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> I'm not... that's a big factor. Yeah, the the whole motion sickness thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've had it since since I can remember. I always get car sick, you know, plane, too, yeah. planes, everything. So, um, although I do like VR, I had Oculus for a little bit, but I don't have the space to keep it maintained and out on my desk with kids and everything. So. I got rid of it when I get a new office space. I will uh, probably reinvest in it because I really did like it. But do you do you know how uh, do you know why motion sickness occurs? <laughs> it's a really I'm just gonna I, say I, poor I, poor genes, poor genetics. But well, well so <laughs> so the actual like the the actual process that's happening uh, is. Um, so, so like your brain, you know, it, it between, between what your inner ear senses for motion and what your eyes see, it's, it's basically stitching together a picture of, of, you know, space and presence. And so your, your inner ear, that's, that's your, that's your balance, you know, so it, it like your, your inner ear will detect shifts as you, as you walk around, as you lean, all of that. Uh, and then, you know, your vision is, is what you see. And, um, and they always match up and your brain is constantly making sure they match up. Uh, and so, so like if you are, uh, um, you know, like, like if you're, if you're on a boat, you know, or if you're reading a book in the car, uh, and you're seeing, you know, you're looking at the book, you're looking at the boat and then things like your, your balance isn't lining up to what you're seeing. 
uh, or you know, if you're in VR and you look around and your vision lags by a moment, or if you're super drunk and you know your <laughs> your your balance is all off and your vision is all is all off, uh, what happens is your brain it detects this mismatch between what you see and what kind of you know what what motion your ears are sensing, uh, and it concludes that you must have eaten some poison berries. And it causes you to evacuate the contents of your stomach because it just it, it's I mean, it, it's like a really neat self-diagnostic system in people where it's like, oh, yep, vision does not match balance. Therefore, you got poisoned. Let's just barf and ask questions later, you know, and that's, and that's motion sickness. Well, that's enlightening because I do wear glasses. I've had uh -huh. um, numerous ear operations when I was a kid. And I like to drink uh, a lot of beer, so there, I got, yeah, <laughs> I got I got three things going against me that are going to make me motion sickness. So right, right. That's I mean, that's <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I appreciate yeah. you guys um, taking the time uh, to chat with us today. Certainly, some uh, good conversation there. Why don't you tell people, um, you know, where they can follow along with you guys, Twitter or your website? Um, so. Of course, we want to direct them to Steam or the PlayStation Store where they can get uh, Salt and Sanctuary. The, uh, mm -hmm. On Steam, it's seventeen ninety nine. It's the same on PlayStation? Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, and our, our Twitter is at Ska Studios. Uh, yeah, I think our personal Twitters are more active. I, like, I check our Ska Studios Twitter um, here and there. It's on my TweetDeck feed. But our personal Twitter is at James Zella with one L and at Shell Dragon. With two L's. <laughs> um, That's probably the best place. So, yeah. Michelle, you, I think sometime toward the end of September, you tweeted something out that resonated with me. And this will be the very last question, I promise. And uh, as someone who grew up in the punk rock scene, someone who grew up as not really a jock, not really a nerd, didn't really find my place, I resonated with this, uh, with this tweet. You said something to the effect of, we've always felt rather left out of the club of indie devs. Uh, yeah. If there, if there is such a thing. Do you guys want to? Just talk about that just real quick before we end this out. I don't I don't know if it's our age or if we're just not cool kids, but it seems like there's there's definitely cliques amongst sure. um, indie devs and really any social scene that must happen in. Um, and, you know, we're, we're friendly people. We like making friends and hanging out, but we always just get this sense that we're not part of the cool kid club. Um <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah like, I, I always thought part of it too was just being like an Xbox exclusive studio for for like six or seven years, and then you, you kind of, I don't know, may, maybe we we kind of give off this vibe of like of like we're just we're just working for the man, you know, <laughs> we're not we're not part of the of of the the indie movement to uh, to get everyone away from the shackles of corporations or whatever it is they're into. Um, <laughs> but now we're on Steam and PlayStation. Does that earn us any credit? I don't know, man. <laughs> well, I just wanted to bring that up because, like I said, I resonate with that. I've, you know, I felt like that, you know, growing up in, you know, teenage years. And then even when, with my own band, we were too, too heavy for the punk rockers. We were too, I don't know what we were for the hardcore kids. We weren't tough enough for the hardcore kids or whatever. So um, <laughs> I just wanted right. to bring that up because you're not alone. There's others out there that feel like that too. So All right. Solidarity. Yeah. Yes. So again, Michelle and James, thanks for your time. And uh, we'll be in touch when there's uh, more news. When you announce the next game, we'll love to have you back on. Awesome. Thanks for having sure us on. Thanks a lot. All right, again, that was James and Michelle from Ska Studios. We thank them for their time. We had them originally on the show, I want to say two Christmases ago. I think I did a holiday special show where it was nothing but interviews, and that was the pre-Salt and Sanctuary days. I think they were just announcing the game, and they still had a ways to go. So I appreciate them taking the time to come back on. You know what? I just I just realized before we went to commercial break, did we ever or not commercial break, the interview break, did we say what what comic we wanted as a uh, as a video game? We did not. No. Good call, Corey. <laughs> After the break, it only took me a whole break to realize it. All right, so why don't we uh, go into that first? <laughs> Would you give us your answer, Corey? Uh, I I did not have an answer for this for the longest time, um, but I just thought of one today actually. Um, I would have to go with a, um, a well-established comic book being turned into a game. I would like Brian K. Vaughn's Saga. I think that would make an excellent Telltale-style game, as long as Brian K. Vaughn was allowed to write a majority of it. I don't Have either of you guys ever read Saga? No. 
No, well, I'm hoping anybody else who has read Saga is agreeing with me. Joe, I hope you're saying yes right now because I think this would make a cool story. Um, they wouldn't be able to really use many of the characters from from the comic, but I think they could probably make a very compelling story as far as uh, as far as Saga goes. It's a very interesting, weird, magical sci-fi fantasy universe, but they've made the characters very, very grounded, and the characters are really compelling. And it's always like character driven, kind of like uh, kind of like Walking Dead. It's always character driven. So I think that would make like a really good Telltale game. So Saga is my answer. Awesome. Jay, how about yourself? Uh, mine is a kind of an odd one, but not so odd. Uh, for me, it would be Comic Jumper. Um, yes. I absolutely love the game. There's pictures of the comic books. They even have pages, like single pages of the comics, but they never actually made a comic, um, a run of any of the comics. Uh, that was, so, that was uh, Twisted Pixel, right? That, that was, was like Twisted an Pixel. Game. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorites. It's, it's probably my favorite from them. Um, yes. They made uh, like Explosion Man, Clone and Clyde, all those. Uh, well, not Clone and Clyde, but um, Explosion Man, Miss Explosion Man, uh, The Maw. But, um, yeah, Comic Jumper, I would absolutely love to see a comic of it because, they, you know, it's all lined up. They've got the ideas and everything, the stories and whatnot. I think it would have been kind of neat to have a, uh, the comic that falls along with it. And as far as a game that would be a comic, uh, you know, that's probably the toughest one for me. Um, but um, I was thinking I think Darksiders would be pretty cool. As a comic, because it kind of the uh, in the games, the uh, art style is kind of comic ish. So, you have way, two, so. two games as comics? Well, he, he's going both ways. He's going from game to comic oh, and comic okay, to no. game. Okay. No, well, Dark no, they're both, no, they're both games to comic. Yeah, he's got two answers so. Dark Siders oh. and Comic Jumper are both yeah. video games. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. And then, well, as far as a comic, uh, no idea, because <laughs> I don't have enough comics. That's all right. We only, we only needed one direction. But Comic Jumper was such a such an underrated game, in my opinion. I loved the shit out of that game, and because they touched on like these different genres of comics, you know, they did like uh, anime style comic book, and um, oh god, what else did they do? Like they did like the teen romance comics, and they did like oh, they, they did, did everything. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it was like four or five different genres, and they're all really good. I had the, a shirt I got from PAX that had that little star guy on the front of it. I think I still have that shirt. Yeah. I've got the one with the Brad Copter on it. Oh yeah, the Brad Copter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that, yeah, that would be so awesome. Though that, which, like I said, that was the weird one because it's you'd think it's a comic already, but it's not. So, so my answer here is very much along the lines of what uh, Jeremy Dad's Getting Grounded said. For me, it's all about my youth and nostalgia. And maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong and, and tell me that there was great games for these comics already. But I would love a great video game for G.I. Joe and for uh, the Justice League. You know, those are shows that I, as a kid, I used to watch religiously. And mm. I don't ever remember, at least in the modern era here, you know, Xbox, original OG Xbox, PS2 on, of great video games for either of those franchises. No, I don't oh. think there there were there's a few NES games, the GI Joe games, and they're all insanely punishingly hard and not good. Like they're just <laughs> never very good. I think there was um well they did have a GI Joe game for when Rise of Cobra came out, right. that movie. But that was pretty good. Yeah, that was a PS2 yeah, game. That was that was garbage. And Shovel um, Whale. The uh, something about Atlantis. There was an NES game. I, I should know this. I'm embarrassed now. Something Atlantis game. That was just punishingly tough. There hasn't really been a good one. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I have no interest in reading comics. It's just I don't have anything against it. It's just you know, first of all, I don't want the physical stuff in my house. I have too much stuff as it is. I know you can say you can get the digital stuff, but the digital stuff, it, at least to me, seems to doesn't have the same spirit as. Um, you know, flipping the pages and things like that. So I just never really got into it. But as far as comics to video games, yes, G.I. Joe, Justice League, I would love that. You know, it's what always sort of scratched my head about the Toys to Life thing is, you know, they just maybe it's the licenses that cost too much, but you just think you had a Justice League with all various guys. Um, same thing with G.I. Joe. I mean, we had all the figures when we were kids. You know, I remember cutting out those um, 
coupons on the back of the G.I. Joes to get the, like, the Cobra points or whatever and then mailing them in and they would send you a special character. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I remember doing that. I actually still have I'm, – I'm in my little nerd cave den downstairs right now and I coll- – I, kept all my gi joes and i was like a big gi joe nerd as a kid i had over a hundred of them and i i have almost all of them still the ones that i didn't like destroy and set on fire and uh my daughter still plays with them so like that makes me that makes my soul happy to just watch her play with all the gi joes because i still remember most of their names and all that shit yeah the only ones we ever kept were the star wars ones so we got like the darth vader case oh nice yeah so yeah those would be my two responses so uh, apologies that we didn't get that uh, answered out. Sometimes I do that. I skip ahead. So thank you for bringing that to my attention, Corey. And no thank you to everybody that um, answered. We appreciate the participation weekly. So now where were we? We were going to talk about what games we've been playing. And a common theme amongst our list is Gears of War 4. So Absolutely. I think we are in various stages of... Of the campaign, so why don't we tackle this in two subject matters: campaign, and then you know we can talk multiplayer co-op separately. So um, I think I'm on Act Three. Just um, the DBs seem to be slowly fading away, or maybe they're in the in there the whole time. But there is a new enemy introduced, a slimier enemy. Uh, so that's where I'm at in the game. Uh, how about you guys? Are you uh, much farther along than that? Act four, um, uh, first section of, of Act four. So, okay. Oh, so yeah. you're a little ahead then. I, I think I'm just ahead of you, Mike. I'm in uh, Act three, chapter uh, like five or something. The DBs definitely do drop away, but I haven't I haven't yeah. reached what is obviously going to be the end. There's a I went down a very large elevator, and I'll just leave it at that. That's what I just okay. did. Okay, so I haven't got to that. So we'll, that's that just gives at. us that just gives us like some parameters, so we won't spoil anything uh, too much. Uh, what are you guys playing on? Uh, what setting? I'm just playing normal out of the box. I didn't make any adjustments. I'm playing on hardcore. I am playing hardcore. Yeah. I don't love the franchise that much to uh, play it much <laughs> longer than I need to. So normal out of the box is a okay with me. Well, if you go in and look at the settings, it says uh, there's normal. F- never played a shooter. Uh, or easy than normal, which is play to shooter, but new to the series. And then they say hardcore is the way it's supposed to be played. Oh, yeah, I, so let's change it up on people. When you used to play normal, <laughs> you're just thinking, fuck, yeah, exactly. I'm playing normal. I didn't think I'd have to look yeah. at the fine print. So it's just like normal in parentheses for pussies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, That's so what they've cl- done since like two. So, so let's just- clear it up. I'm playing it on pussy mode then, a.k.a. normal. <laughs> Um, as I was telling Jay yesterday in a series of um, text, up until last night when I jumped back in, I thought it was a snooze fest. I thought it was boring as hell, um, maybe to the point of generic. You know, certainly when you start the game and you're in that like um, cog world that they're trying to build, you know, yep. where the robots are building it and stuff like that. I know that is meant to give off like that cookie cutter vibe because that's what they're doing. They're just erecting these universes or worlds or cities. cities yeah. um, so it's supposed to have that, you know, feel to it. But there was nothing really compelling there. And just the waves and waves of DBs, I was like, all right, I've seen this. You know, can, we, can we progress beyond this? Yeah, the but, DBs are boring. I don't like fighting the DBs. Like I, one of the reasons I play Gears is so I can see like that really brutal, graphic, satisfying violence. And the DBs do not deliver on that. I totally agree with that. The, uh, I like did, it what, covered in what, oil. What did you think about the uh, the tutorial, like the uh, like the flashback intros? I like that. Me yeah. too. I, yeah. I found I found those all very interesting. And then they switched over to the like the group of people that you're playing as the main protagonist and his friends. And I I totally agree with you. I found that very boring. Uh, I don't want to keep this spoiler free. Right up until the part where you ride the mules and have to fight a vulture. And I don't want to say anything about that. But that, um, whatever you want to call it, like not it wasn't a cutscene, but. Uh, like set piece, I thought that was completely fun. I loved doing yeah. that part. I didn't know what the hell I was doing there. I just kept on shooting the vulture. And then eventually <laughs> it ended. And then Jay was telling me about some sort of lightning thing. And maybe because you guys are on hardcore and I'm on pussy mode. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I came to this lightning thing and I'm like, what's the big deal? It was like sort of like hopscotch. Just for <sighs> jump. I jumped around it and boom, I was past it. 
it didn't hurt like in uh in the mode that we're playing in if you get even like touched by it, you're dead like immediately dead and there were quite a few of them i i think that mm-hmm. that one part took me like two tries i think it didn't touch me at all i mean uh, yeah i think i would assume the same thing would happen to me but it was just sort of like a rhythm thing like you saw them you you waited behind some sort of barrier and then they, it stopped and then you ran as fast as you could once it stopped yeah see i had uh you can't even stop yeah, I, I had I like stopped behind a barrier and I was going to do that and then they like that wave that went by stopped and I jumped over the barrier to run and as I was running more kept coming down. Like I had to dodge as I ran, which was yeah. a pain. But that that hasn't been I really haven't run into anything too tough on hardcore. There's been That lightning couple. part was probably the hardest for me. And and uh, you know, no big spoilers, but dodge, duck and roll. <laughs> 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 I did that last night while I was talking to Matt. He was um, on Xbox Live just chatting, and I had no issues with it. So I was, I was saying, Matt, I was like, here I am at this particular game, part of the game. Jay says it's going to be difficult, so get ready for some F-bombs. And, uh, <laughs> you walked right, right through it. <laughs> I walked right through it. I remember like, uh, like Jay gave me a couple of codes for Judgment just before um, – four came out because i was really really like itching to play gears and i'd never played judgment before and i got about maybe halfway through it and i really felt like that was kind of like horde mode the campaign there was like a lot of obvious horde sections of it and i was worried gears four was just going to do that too because they have like what horde what are they calling it that's what it feels like in a lot of them sections they just there's a couple playing horde yeah it's like holy shit this is horde they didn't really beat you over the head with it too much i think i've only run into what two of them I think they put it they they inserted it into the but it was just odd for them. It's almost like they were tr- it was that was your tutorial for Horde. Right, yeah. By playing the campaign, which none of the others had done before. They ran out of story, is what it feels like to me. What what do you think about four the waves, uh, four waves of it? It felt like really we're going to do four waves of this thing. What do you guys think about like the the characters and like the writing and the dialogue in comparison to the other Gears games? I don't. To me, I wanted when the game they showed it. What was it? Last E three or two E threes ago? Um, it had some like scary moments in it, and it was tense. And I've already got to that point, and it wasn't scary or tense at all. So I don't know what the hell I was watching, but <laughs> it felt. I wanted something that was dark, and you know, had some more horror elements to it. This feels like fucking bubblegum romper room type shit to me. I don't feel the di- you know the dialogue to me unless I'm missing some good shit here that to me just feels like you know noise it doesn't just I like don't think it's it. yeah I don't think it's written as well as uh, like three two and three um really yeah I, I don't I, I really don't yeah, I feel I was just because I feel like the exact opposite I think this is probably got the best writing as far as all the three gears games go because all, all i mean a gears game is essentially just about roadie running and hiding behind cover and shooting monsters and making a big mess it doesn't get b- much beyond that but i i don't know there were a few character interactions that i thought were were better and more well written than any of the other three gears games certainly some of the cutscene stuff like when you and again we don't want to weigh too much into spoilers here but we already know this if you watch the tv commercial you know this happens that marcus is in there i thought that was some good stuff when you when you see him and he, you know, there's the back and forth between him and his son. Like, what have you yeah. done? You know, th- that was pretty decent. Yeah. Um, you know, when they go, when they go further along with that story, and they go to a certain place and sort of armor up. You know, that had some feels to it there as well. To me, the best thing, and I, you know, again, I want to get back to, I want to be scared a little. I want to have some tension. You know, that cutscene when you're in the barn, and the lady um, puts you in the barn. And you just see the feet underneath. Yeah, yeah. And you really can't see what's going on. To me, that was the best part that I've experienced so far. And I hope that continues. I mean, that's what I want. I want to. I remember the first time I saw what's it, General Rom, mm-hmm. the, the boss at the end of for the first Gears. I mean, to me, that was like you know, a big moment. I want to see moments like that. I don't care what these three people are talking about in between. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, as far as that goes, I mean, I guess the dialogue between characters probably is better than some of the other games. It's just, it's the story. I just, I keep picking apart, and it's just like, what the heck? It, it seems a little odd to me. However, I am enjoying it, and and I am literally grinding through it. I'm just c- continue to play. I'm, I just want to 
keep playing until I finish it. And then I'll go back and play again, which is what I usually do. Um, Corey, have you got any more about campaign? or? Have uh, I, ha- I haven't played any of the campaign cooperatively. Have you guys done that? No. 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 I mean, maybe I'll do hardcore mode for that. I mean, we just go back real quick to the characters. I mean, didn't it feel a little stereotypical that the black guy had sort of like some street lingo and the fat Mexican guy was a drunk? I mean, it just, <laughs> it just to me. Spoilers, it, Mike. <laughs> not a. You know, it's just to me, I was just like, you know, I don't know, can we put a little bit more imagination into this? It, I was well, disappointed I mean, in that aspect. There were no, like, all the other Gears games, I felt like Marcus, like, he had, like, no dialogue. It was all very boring. Aside from Baird and a few interactions with Cole, I always thought they were super boring, flat characters. They would just yell about the resonator. And, and Marcus would yeah. say sweet whenever he picked up armor. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was like nothing to any of those characters. I like these character interactions a little bit better, but I really don't like JD that much. Like Marcus's son, I, I could care less about, except when he's interacting with Marcus. I did enjoy those conversations. I liked I like Marcus's uh, tomato line that actually made yeah. me laugh. And I don't I, I don't think I've ever laughed playing a Gears game aside from maybe a couple of throwaway lines from Baird now and again. Oh, you got to play co-op with us sometime then. <laughs> Who's what, the um, voice actor for JD? Do we know? Uh, I don't know if he's any. I mean, it's not ringing any bells for me. But. It sounds like. Um, oh, what the hell's his name? The guy that was Liam in. Liam McIntyre uh, is his oh, name. Oh, no. Okay. So, what I'm seeing on Twitter, and it's kind of funny, and I don't know if it's publishers being jealous of each other or what, but I saw Pete Hines of Bethesda say, boy, JD sounds a lot like uh, Nolan North. And he even kind of looks a little bit like Nathan Drake. And then I saw the guy from, um, what is it, um, People Can Fly, Mm -hmm. um, you know, who did Judgment, saying, you know, it felt like this isn't anything new, which is sort of like an interesting thing coming from him. Um, Well, he he does look like a – I admit I think he does kind of look like Nathan Drake, and that might be something they're going for. But A, he's not nearly as compelling as Nathan Drake. And and B, that's a – that is a – a, a certain type of character like Nathan Drake is essentially Mal from uh, Firefly. Like they're very, very similar character types. So like and both of which I enjoy. But I think I think J.D. is not quite there. I think he's just too boring. I don't think he's that funny. I think Nathan Drake is much funnier. Does anybody have a certain sense of where the story is going? I have my own theories. And maybe if we talk about it, it's too much spoilers. But I have, does anybody feel like they know already what's going to happen? Too I much feel spoilers. I, I yeah I, I I won't say any spoilers, but I feel like what they're going to do is they're going to set up three more. This is this is essentially the first one and another three is what I bet. Okay, well we'll certainly uh, maybe either have a spoiler cast or talk about it you yes. know months down down the road because I I certainly feel like I and sort of understand what's going on. I don't know if I necessarily know where it's going to end up, but just where I'm at now in the story, it sort of feels like something happened here, some sort of natural or unnatural event occurred um let's talk about horde mode and co-op and stuff like that yes the other night um the three of us along with uh dan and christian from dad's getting grounded we completed horde mode on casual so that's somewhere below pussy mode right that's like oh yeah most definitely yeah but i'll take it (laughs) <laughs> it did uh, like it's hard I, as hell, man. Yeah, I did shit on it when we first started. Oh, this is casual. I don't want to play casual. But once we got up to about like mid thirties, it it yeah. would, it got it got challenging, and we didn't really know what we were doing that much. Like I think if we had had a better grasp of the level, and I think if we had and en- had an engineer, we would have done much much better. Yeah, we had no engineer. We didn't know how to play it. I mean, this was my second time playing Horde, and we it, I can't believe we made it through. Yeah. I mean, some of those guys, like Christian, really, you know, put a lot of hours. What do you say, 700 hours in Gears 3? Yeah, Yeah, it was a lot. Um, So he was, you know, pretty good with some of the stuff, bailed us out of a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, times when we were down. So that was good. I love the way we threw caution to the window at level 50. We're like, you know, 49 levels, we had the, um, the, um, what do they call that box again? I always want to call it the frag box, but that's how it is. (laughs) The the fabricator. The fabricator. fabricator. Thank you. Um, 
you know, for 50, 49 levels, we kept the fabricator in one spot. Level 50, we're like, fuck it, this isn't good enough. We got to go somewhere else. <laughs> well, yeah, we couldn't do it in the other spot. Too many, so we, it worked out. We were on the ship level, and we moved it to a place where they couldn't really sneak up behind us. They only if could we, come in the sides and the front. Yeah, if we'd played there, I think from the beginning it would have been much easier too. That a was lot a lot easier. Yeah, a lot smarter spot, and we didn't even find it until the end. Now, I again didn't was there was a horde mode in in Judgment, I imagine, right? But was where the don't classes? Know if there was, to be honest with you, I, I never played it. So the Judgment is, have beast mode. Is that what that was in Judgment? No. I remember all those traps. I remember playing it with Junkie, me and oh, you could be the beast. That's remember, right. Remember, yes, you could be the beast. That's right. They did have stuff. it. Yep. Now, could you – were there – there's never been classes in uh, in Horde mode. That's a new thing to Horde mode. Am I, am I wrong in saying that? Uh, um, I think like, so. like, that's new. I think before you could just buy upgrades for everything, right? Right. Because of who you were. Yeah, so so anybody like debating on buying this um, because of of horde mode and it's slightly different. It seems a little more complicated when you first start playing it because horde mode used to just be play with your friends. Here comes enemies. It used to be like the most basic of basic concepts, and now they have added some complications to it. But once you figure them out, which doesn't take very long at all, it's way more fun, I think, because there's uh, when you kill enemies, these enemies drop like we were calling it cash last night. It's some sort of like energy that when you go pick it up and bring it back to the fabricator that we were talking about where you're going to make your little home base, you can use that and spend it on like cash to create things like barriers and turrets and so forth. So like the scout will pick up more. The engineer can build more or has like a discount when building. Yeah. It's uh, I like it better than the old horde mode. What about you guys? I think it gives it more legs because you have to figure all that stuff out. Like I said, we played on the casual mode and made it, mode and made that made it through. But you know, we, if, I think if we were on another level up, there's no way we would have gotten through because we weren't doing anything. You know, using those advanced um, skills and whatnot. To me, I was disappointed that the campaign, when it runs you through that type of pseudo horde mode, that it didn't have the same thing. Because I started out playing horde mode, and then I went into the campaign. So I was used to running around collecting uh, the energy and using the fabricator mid-wave uh, to build stuff. And then I wasn't able to do that in the campaign, and that was a disappointment. Yeah, you you get it automatically. But yeah, I think they, they make you wait in between waves, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was hoping that I could, you know, build stuff mid-wave and, you know, make it a little bit more compelling instead of it was just sort of wait, kill everybody, go back, build the traditional way. Yeah, and they have uh, they have these, like, uh, for your customization, you have, like, uh, cards, and you can put those, you can use those cards, um, I don't know what you want to call it, in, in your, like, profile. When Let's say I'm going to play as a scout, and I have certain cards that I you have packs. Like these, uh, almost like baseball cards that you'll like spend in game currency on, and you can buy additional um, as DLC, not DLC, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, microtransactions. In but you game open, purchases. Yeah, and and you get these cards, and you can use them. Like my scout, if I have a car, a certain card, I can use it, and I can what, run faster, or my area of picking things up is more. And every single different. Uh, class has different cards they can use so like like jay said i think it has legs uh i still want to play horde mode even though we beat it you know even though we beat it once i still want to keep playing and, and level up my different classes but well, we didn't really beat it because we were on pansy mode yeah that... <laughs> i felt like we beat it because it was so late in the day yeah it was 1 30 in the morning when i went to bed oh, yeah. and my daughter decided to wake up at 5 30 the next morning so Ooh, yeah. that was awesome Oh, but I enjoyed it. I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed playing that. Um, the next thing I had to try is some of the uh, multiplayer stuff, which I haven't tried. Uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, dodgeball or something like that? Yeah, I haven't played dodgeball yet, but actually just before we started recording, I played my first uh, game of uh, Arms Race, where like uh, you're, it's like a three-on-three, three, and as soon as one team gets three kills with a certain gun, they move on to the next gun. And it's like a race to get to the end, the, the very last gun. So, like, you could be on the torque bow, and the other team is all rocking uh, Nashers, which, yeah. which it changes the dynamic of the, uh, the game because one team could be dominating, but as soon as they run into, uh, okay, they have to use, you know, uh, close-range weapons when the other team has sniper rifles, it's a cool dynamic and, and forces certain weapons to be used. 
Yeah, that makes it interesting, and it, and it gets hard too. Because I mean, if they, if the other team is on the, you know, the upgrade where they're using, you know, uh, torque bows or, 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 you know, some of the Drop. other heavy weapons, you know, and then you you go up through and you're on the one where you're using pistols, you know, it makes it tougher. So, yeah, you gotta they, you have to change how you play. Like, uh, like if you're on the right. ball ball talk and they have the um, long shot like you have to try and get in close and they have to try to keep distance between you guys yeah. so it's, it, it is cool i did enjoy yeah. it yeah and then the, the reason i say that it, the uh dodgeball one was interesting is because when you get a kill it if you have somebody on your team that was killed uh it brings them back back into the game so you had kind of go back and forth like that so i want to that one i want to try that at some point in time so so do you have to just you just essentially have to exterminate the entire other team? Is that how it works? Right, you have to exterminate the entire other team. However, if they get a kill, it brings back one of their people. That's so, interesting. And vice versa. So yeah, so it's kind of interesting in that in that way. Quickly circle back to the the cards and, and in game purchases. Now nothing so far that I have seen earns you packs. You only earn money to buy packs. So we did that whole level, uh, you know, 1 through 50 of Horde mode, and there was no rewards when you go into the store and look at packs. My inventory was completely empty. Certainly there was money that we earned, but um, has anybody found any sort of situation where you earn packs? Uh, I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen earning packs, like straight up packs, but like you said, you, you, I think I'm, I'm earning mostly my in-game currency through multiplayer games, but it's very, it's very slow. So it's better than the Gears 3, um, debacle that came out where like, you know, 30% of the gun skins were available and the 70% were locked behind additional content that you had to buy. This way you, you can get everything. But it's it's the it's like how most mobile games are. If you put in a lot of time, you can get it, or you can buy you know additional. You can buy in. yeah, right. So it's it's like mobile games, but it is tough. It's very slow earning that currency. Mm. Yeah, and I also have yet to play any of the cards that you were talking about prior to horde mode. I don't know if we're too busy talking or if it goes by too fast. But I have all these cards, you know, sitting in my inventory, but I've never uh, used any of them. So I haven't figured out when you can use them because it's not like you can go in between. No, you do it um, before you start a game. Like if, if you're playing multiplayer, right. you, you set you set your bounty um, just before the game starts. And if you're uh, you can go into the horde mode menu and before like, you know, not even just before a game starts at any time while you're in the menus, you go to like uh, horde bounties or something like that and you set it. That's how you said it before. Sure. So, like, I, I set – I don't think I used one when we beat it last night. But, uh, you know, that's what I'll usually do is if I know I'm going to play Horde, I'll set, like, you know, beat 20 levels as a soldier. And I'll set that before I go and play Horde yeah. mode. Or if, if I know I'm playing a certain game type, like um, uh, whatever that one uh, – Arms Race, I have a card for Arms Race. I'll play that really quick. And yeah. But you do you set it up before the match. Yeah, and I've got a card that I had that's for the soldier because I picked a soldier and went in when we played the the horde mode, and I'm not sure if it's specific for horde mode or not, but it like it gives me 55 percent more ammo for uh, the lancer. Yeah, if you if you set it and if you play as that st- as that type, I thought you were a scout last night. I don't remember. I know. That I don't I- know. It came up and said it was for for soldier, but yeah. Oh, okay. I think- yeah but it is it is a it's deeper and more customizable than any other previous uh gears games which it makes me want to play it longer yeah yeah so we'll see how you know how much longer it goes on but i mean that that's basically it i think uh played campaign and horde and i haven't really got into the multiplayer uh how about you mike well the only thing other thing i want to say is i was disappointed that you couldn't change characters midway through so there's a particular point in horde where it shows your level up progress i thought that would have been a good time not to necessarily change your um class like i don't think it would be fair to go from right. engineer to scout or scout but the actual to soldier. character but the actual you know i had this one day of the dead character that everybody was picking on me because <laughs> oh he my was, god that thing's was, awesome he was wearing the flowers in his outfit and everything like that. So I love, I loved your blouse. It was fantastic. Yeah, my, my uh, house dress was <laughs> awesome. That's what it looked like. Yeah. 
So it would have been nice to change characters. And also, what if when you're leveling up like that, changing some of your perks or whatever, changing some of those cards, I understand doing it after every wave is, is not ideal, but maybe once or twice. Maybe after we got a all boss, these cards that we're using. Battle. What's that? Like maybe after like one of the boss waves, because there's what only five boss waves, I think. Yeah. So hopefully they're listening to feedback and maybe they'll we'll see some of that type of change come. But it felt a little weird that you couldn't change your character or play any of these other cards for the whole 50 waves. It was like, make your choice in the beginning and that's it. You can't do anything else. Well, they have bounty cards and then they have like skill cards. And skill cards are the one that you can, they're not, um, you don't use them up. You know, like you just uh, attach them to your, your character like your scout or your sniper or whatever. And uh, once you you know play a lot of Horde as a sniper or scout, you can unlock different slots so you can use more than one card. Like right now, when you're early on, you probably only have one slot available. Eventually, I think you can unlock a total of four or five. I don't know. I got to get more. I got to get the hang of it more because I'm just – I haven't played any of the cards. I think we're just yapping too much in that pre-screen thing. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't played any of my cards, so – I will eventually get the hang of that, but let's move on. Uh, Corey, what else have you been playing? Uh, I've really only been playing Gears 4, but today, no, yesterday I bought uh, Jazz Punk, came to PS4. I think it came last month and I didn't even notice. But I heard uh, a ton of people talking about this game last year on Steam, that it was like uh, very, very funny and uh, really worth playing. And I told myself if it comes to console, I'll buy it. So I bought it. I have not even had a chance to play it, so... I can't talk about it that much. Anyone else who's played it, though, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and uh, let me know what you think. It's supposed to be very, very funny, and you don't get to play a lot of funny games anymore. So that's that's pretty much it for me. All right. Jay, what about you? Uh, the Gears, of course. Uh, the Battlefield 1 Early Access. Uh, mm. Played some of that. Yeah, let's talk uh, about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. I, I really I like the story. I like I've been wanting a you know a trench warfare um, kind of game, um, which man do you uh, die often? But that's what trench warfare was. Um, I'm enjoying that. The, the, I think the biggest issue for me is I don't know who to shoot because um, watching it and over your guys is like just a little tiny blue dot and it blends in with the backgrounds of the, you know, the, you know, it's kind of uh, grays and, and blacks and they kind of, it blends in. So I don't really see it as much. So I'm having a hard time figuring out who I have to shoot because it's pretty concentrated with the, with all the people that are around you. So, uh, and with the weapons that you're using. So I am, I, I'm enjoying it, but um, I'm, I'm having a few issues. So something that, I gotta get used to. How does it look? Because, I mean, it looks pretty oh, it looks gorgeous. gorgeous. And, and just to jump back to Gears uh, 4 for a second, I think this is the best-looking Xbox One game I've ever played, like, hands down. I think Gears 4 is beautiful. So, and, and I mean, BF1 looks fantastic from what I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Jay has certain opinions, I think, on how Gears looks. I certainly think it, it looks good. I thought Rise of the Tomb Raider looks better. I in agree. My personal, in my personal opinion. Um Jay, I think you've described the look as uh, it's kind flat. of a flat look. You know, you, you're looking at a wall that has tiles on it, but you look at it. There's no shiny spots on the individual tiles. You know, there's no texture to it. You don't really see the grout lines and stuff like that. It's it's flat. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not as realistic looking as like Tomb Raider or Battlefield and stuff like that. So. I think the way I said it on the 40 cast is it's a beautiful looking game. Uh, I think they did a really good job with it. But it, like Jason, it doesn't have the realism, but that's not a bad thing. They just no. made a really good looking video game. You know, yeah. it doesn't, not everything has to look like something outside your window. You know what I mean? So it doesn't have the realistic aspects to it, but it's just a really good looking video game. Yeah, I, I love the like all the 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 uh, outside environments with the wind and all that. But whenever I got to something where uh, you know things would get wet and messy when you would like blow up uh, enemies, I I did not like the textures of the the liquidy uh, no. blood and guts and all that stuff. That's what is the only thing that's bothered me in Gears Four as far as looks go. But when I'm outside and like it's it's nighttime and you see the trees blowing like independently and the leaves going. You know, getting blown off the trees. I thought that looked gorgeous. 
I would agree. It's not a, there's nothing wrong with the visuals, in my opinion. I just don't think you can compare it to a game that's going to talk about realism. I just what, think. About, what about Battlefield 1? How does that look? To me, Battlefield 1 looks awesome. Yeah, it looks great. It, it's um, realistic. For me, and I don't, I don't like repeating myself, but it's, it's what happens when you're on multiple shows. Um, I haven't had more chance to play since I was on the 40 cast, but I was hoping for a continuous story. Like, take a soldier from beginning to end through this and give me a really good story. And that's not what they've done. They've taken multiple soldiers. So one soldier could be John Smith. You got him for 15 minutes and you die. Well, if you've progressed far enough, you're in a different spot and you get a different character, a different name. If you haven't progressed far enough, you start with a new character, but just where you happen to die, wherever your checkpoint was. How does that work, Mike? Did do you think that it's when you die they switch to a different character, or is there a certain amount of time you're allowed to play those characters? Because I played through the same area twice um, the first time, and it, it I felt like I lived a little bit longer with a few of the people and before it transitioned over, but it, it still gives you the same story. It tells you in the beginning that you're, you're not expected to survive. Right. right. So, like you just said, if you go long stretches without dying, eventually your character does succumb at some point and you switch over. Whether you actually see yourself dying because, you know, there's a guy in front of you and you weren't quick enough to kill him or because something happened in the world like an explosion and then yeah. all of a sudden it, it's transitioned into a new part of the story. Yeah, if I didn't get shot to death, I found that uh, it would be an explosion that would take me out. Right. Um, but again, you know, these are like small little missions that are on this sort of map. Yeah. And, you know, you can do them in chronological order or you can probably go back and replay them and look like maybe two. It's not really what I wanted. I wanted, you know, a, a real, a really solid campaign that takes me from A to Z about either a character or a group of characters that I could get invested in. And that's not what this is. Yeah. Uh, anybody yeah, anybody was, ride any horses? How, no, horse I haven't got physics. to that point yet. Just tanks at this particular point. I tried the horses once in the alpha and I couldn't stand it. Yeah, was so. it better? Was it better than Roach? Had to have been better than Roach. Well, the reason I didn't like the horse is because you get sniped almost immediately. If you're not in cover, you'd get sniped almost immediately in the Alpha, at least because of the map that they had. Um, uh, the the maps that you're on that I've played so far. Again, I'm like Mike. I haven't played much of it. Uh, I've played very little so far. Um, but you're in a very enclosed map. There's a there's there's some open area, but there's like uh, destroyed houses you can hide behind and stuff. And then uh, some of the other ones uh, you can hide behind uh, tanks and stuff that are moving through. And then there's trenches that you can dive down into and you kind of go through. And then, the, again, the destroyed houses and stuff like that. So um, I didn't run into any of the sniping issues that I had in the campaign that – that we're playing so far. The campaign is, is, is a lot different than what that multiplayer was. So, and one thing that was weird with, this is an early, um, it's not early access. It's EA early, access trial, yeah. trial of, of EA yeah. access. Um, every few minutes, every few minutes, the trial screen would pop up. Yeah. That's like annoying. Every, every two to three minutes, it would say, Mike, you have less than 10 hours to play. Um, and I don't remember. I don't remember that before, so I don't know if that's a bug. And then when you would click the thing to go away, and it would um, it would come, you know, go back. The screen would be like a little jumbled. So I don't know if this was a bug or what. I'm but wondering if they're doing that. Well, I'm wondering if they're doing this too because I imagine you must be able to play the campaign within ten hours because usually Battlefield doesn't have a really long campaign, right? Uh, it depends on your skill level, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, as so I that, say, the uh, the last battlefield, I wouldn't know because it never let me actually play the campaign. It wouldn't save it ever. There's nothing I could do every time oh, I went really? back to it. Yeah, every time I went back to it, my game was gone. So I just stopped after uh, after oh, no it shit. happened like the, the fourth time. Well, let's uh, move on. We beat up that pretty good. Yeah, we um, did. What else you got there, Jay? Um, I had been watching Corey play DuckTales, so I went in and played DuckTales Remastered on my Xbox One, which is it's a backwards-compatible 360 game. 
that I can play on the one, and I'd never actually beaten it. So after watching Corey uh, stream from his NES on the original, while I was watching him play, I went in and played. And, um, you know, over the past two weeks, I finally went in and, and beat it. It doesn't take long to beat. Yeah, it's... And I, uh... It, that, how did you like that last uh, get out of the volcano level, though? That that can be a dick puncher. Yeah, that was a dick puncher. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally got it. I was just kind of chilling out, just sitting back. And I, and I think the remasters, I think they made it a little easier for you. Yeah, they did. You don't actually have to hit uh, down and B to, uh, to pogo, but you can actually go into the settings and change it. There's like difficult pogo or regular yeah. pogo. But yeah, yeah they, they stretched out the levels. They added some... Like a uh, story stuff that was totally unnecessary, but uh, that game's so gorgeous, still looks gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, I I, I enjoyed that. It was one of the games that I remembered playing back back in the day, and and I enjoyed it. So, uh, and I th- I think we had mentioned what was the other one, um, Rescue Rangers. I'd like to see him bring that one back too. That was a fun game. So, yeah, that that would be cool. And and yeah. just a a fun fact for that remaster, Way Forward got all the original cast. For uh, uh, for Ducktales, yeah, so all the original uh, voice actors. Yep, yeah, Alan Young, Alan Young. He was old as fuck at the time. He I was gonna say he wasn't young. <laughs> just just recently actually passed away. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we so miss they, you, Alan Young. So they had him on there. So, um, so I, I that's the game that I finished. So and then I'm been playing Gears, and then I also played some Tomb Raider too, a little bit of that. But uh, I'm mostly uh, going pretty hardcore on, on on Gears to try and get that finished now. Um, and as far as television, I finished Penny Dreadful season three is absolutely incredible, and I believe that is the last season. It's not going to continue on, and they wrapped it up pretty decent. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that. It's it's really weird, you know. You get uh, Frankenstein, you get uh, uh, werewolves, uh, vampires, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So it, it, it it's very interesting, and I and I kind of like the way they took the story. It is definitely not the traditional stories of of those characters. So uh, they made it their own, and I enjoyed that. And I have gone back, and I am. Uh, watching Gotham on Netflix now that they've got uh, the second season has come out. So watching that. And I did watch um, uh, Westworld. Watched the first episode of that. So that's pretty good. So that covers what I've been doing. (laughs) All right. Lots of stuff there, Jay. And let's see. For me, I played a little bit of the Call of Duty Infinite Warfare beta today on PS4. Um if you like the last two versions of Call of Duty, to me it seemed pretty similar. The wall running is still there. The uh, you know double jumps in the air are still there. A um, couple different. I think they got these different armor suits that you can be in now. So it didn't really feel that much different to me. And I still got my ass kicked all the time. So. So there's it's, there's wall running and there's giant armor you can put on. Sounds a lot like that. Uh, that. F- that what is it? Falling Titans game? Like, help me out. I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> yeah, though they've been. This is the third uh, Call of Duty in a row that you can do this type of stuff. I didn't come across any maps that were on space. Maybe there might have been a uh, a snow map or two. I know that's shocking, but I don't see. I didn't see anything that I could distinctively tell that I was in space. I know they're going <clears throat> in space in the story with this one, and there was some sort of. Um, Almost like the one map, Jay, was like the Big E or like the Tops Failed Fair. Yeah. Which was, in, which was interesting. Huh. That'd be, that would be interesting. And besides that, I played a little bit of uh, Salt and Sanctuary. Of course, uh, heard enough of that in the interview, but enjoying that even though I'm not that great at it. <laughs> so let's, uh, Corey, why don't you play the intro to the uh, Dillagav? All right. Yeah, I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> All right, uh, what's it? Studio MDHR, uh, the uh, people responsible for bringing us uh, Cuphead, which everyone's been looking forward to since, what, 2014? 
Um, it's if anyone doesn't know, it's a side scroller. It looks like 1930s animation. Really cool looking. I think it was initially launched as like a boss rush game, but uh, since they've said that it's it's more of a straightforward uh, like side scrolling um, like uh, platformer. But uh, been delayed, delayed until how long? How long has it been pushed back for? 2017. Uh, Mid 2017 too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, for all platforms, Xbox One, Steam, Windows 10. So, uh, yeah, does anybody give a fuck about that? And if so, how many fucks do you give? Jay? Uh, I don't give a fuck that it's been delayed because I want the game to, when it comes out, I want it to be done right. So don't give a fuck about that. What I do give a fuck about is that they need to just stop talking about it. <laughs> Look, the game will come out in 2017. You're not going to hear anything until then. Yeah, I mean, I am, uh, you know, along those lines, I want to agree that, like, maybe zero fucks is the appropriate thing. We have so much to play. Uh, October, especially this month, is a glut of games coming out. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter that another one comes out. Um, but just to change it up and maybe, you know, disagree with Jay a little bit, um, you know, why can't these studios get their shit together sometimes? You know, you... you I know it's a small team and it's your brothers or whatever, um, but sometimes you feel like a game will just never come out, and when it does come out, it just never leaves up to the hype. No Man's Sky comes to mind. Um, are we looking at another situation here where they're, they're just trying to make it the perfect game, put too much polish on it? Yeah. Certainly what we played at PAX felt like a good game to me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun at PAX. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say I give 10 fucks because, you know... Stop trying to polish a turd. Get that bastard out. <laughs> All right. So, so specifically, Jay, how many, What's the number of fucks you give? What is the number of fucks? Or like, yeah, because you didn't you didn't give me an approximation of fucks. At first, it was none, and then some. So, I want to want an estimate of fucks. Well, I, I, I'm taking it. You know, as said, do I look like I give a fuck? So I give a fuck. So a fuck. Okay. A fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said recently that since I got older, I don't care as much when games are pushed back. So I give I give less fucks than I would, you know, several years ago. Because because like you said, Mike, there's lots of stuff to play, and us being old and shitty adults, we have all this other stuff to do. So we're not just like sitting around waiting for these games. But I've been waiting for Cuphead for three years, and I'm really really looking forward to it. I do want it to be a finished game. You know, don't put it out until it's completely polished. Mm-hmm. But but mid-2017, that's the part that bothers me the most. Because what I really wanted to do is I wanted to get a bunch of, uh, you know, those Xbox Live point card things for Christmas and spend it on Cuphead. That's what I wanted to do. And I'm not going to be doing that now. So I give, I, give a, I give a cup full of fucks. That's how many yeah. fucks I give. A cup full. How many fucks can fit in a cup? Um, you know, just to go over that one last time, you know, to put this in perspective, Corey – and Jay, we will already have finished PAX 2017 mm-hmm. and contemplating what we're going to be doing for PAX 2018. And this game still might not be out yet. So they're saying mid. Mid could mean what? June or it could mean August, depending on your definition of mid, right? So sometime yeah. in the summer. So we could we will already have another PAX under our belt. The game could be there again. And then, yeah, yeah. then we... <laughs> We'll be here talking you know, about it, PAX 2018 at that point. So, oh, well, that's what made me care, really care about it was playing it at the last PAX East. So, yeah. um, who knows? Maybe there's a maybe there's something in that just doesn't tie it all together, and they need time to flush it out and make it a cohesive game rather than just this boss rush thing. Anyways, let's move on to the uh, notable releases this week. Uh, Batman: Return to Arkham is out. Battlefield 1, as we already mentioned. The Bug Butcher, a game that I played a bunch on PC and did some streaming with. That's coming out. Uh, Skylanders Imaginators, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, SteamWorld Heist, a game I enjoy on the PS4, is coming to the Wii U this week. So check those out. we got a couple news stories here, and then we'll be uh, all done. The first, Steam Link, headed to certain TVs. And so it uh, looks like they're partnering with Samsung. So some of these new Samsung TVs that are going to come out, they're going to have this technology built into them. 
So it's not an update that they can do to your. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would hope I have two okay. Samsungs. I would hope they could push it out. That'd yeah. be nice. But it sounds like the way I read this, that's going to be for new TVs. Um, so Makes that's sense. a good a good point to uh, circle back to what I talked to at the top of the show. I got a new Samsung TV, and I um, cleaned up my office space, and I hooked up my computer to my TV for the first time rather than using a Steam Link. So I now have a Steam Link in case anybody wants to buy one off of me. I saw it at a good deal. Hit me up. Um, so I hooked up the TV up to my computer, ran gears, looked beautiful. But what happens is now my PC, uh, all the icons on my screen go to like 300%. Everything gets huge like I'm an old person like reading, um, you know, reading a super large resolution. So that's a bummer. Like every time I want to stop playing Gears and then just go back to my two monitors, I have to like readjust everything and my icons go all, all over the desktop everywhere. And also the sound needs to be adjusted every time. So when I play on my TV, I got to go into my you know system tray and make sure the sound is not on for my um, you know, onboard uh, sound card that it's actually using the Samsung TV and vice versa when I switch them around. So and I get the same of, thing here between one monitor and my TV. Yeah, so I just got to do a lot of switching back and forth. And I just have a feeling that there is a more elegant way to do this. So I am uh, reaching out through the podcast to see if any PC gurus, maybe Captain Junkie still listens to us, and maybe I can do this through like a profile. Like I log into one, and it knows all my settings. I log into the other. It knows my more day-in and day-out settings that I would like. So I'm hoping that can be achieved. So if anybody is out there and smart, uh, let me know. This is, uh, of course, on Windows 10 that I'm doing this. But otherwise, gaming on my PC through my new TV looks awesome. Gears looks phenomenal. So uh, couldn't be more happy with uh, with that situation. But just the, uh, all the sort of settings and things like that is a little bit of a bum out. Corey, you're on a Mac, right? So you have no idea about any of this, right? Yeah, I uh, also play Gears on my console. I'm primarily a console gamer, so I'm yeah, I'm not one to talk about uh, yeah. Steam. But yeah, I mean, you right. still need your beefy PC. This just streams from PC to TV, right, wirelessly. Right. That's what this yeah. uh, the Steam That's Link what this does. Article is yes, and I sort and of abandoned then... the article and talked about my woes. <laughs> <laughs> and... But yes, this particular thing, you would no longer need to go out and buy this Steam Link. It's going to be built into these new TVs. So oh, okay. So you would need to have – you don't necessarily need to have a beefy PC. You just need to have um, you know, a computer that can talk to the TV. Uh, probably need to hook them up through like some sort of Ethernet cable because wirelessly is not the best. Even when you buy this Steam Link, it says, yeah, you can do it wirelessly, but it's not going to work the best. So when I had my Steam Link set up, it's an Ethernet port on the back of the link, and I plugged it right into my Verizon um, router. And so it was on the network, and I had no issues whatsoever. So when this is in the, when these are actually in the TV, like they say, are they still going to advise some sort of cable run between the two, or is it just going to be wireless? I imagine like, you probably want to hook your TV up to your router. Oh yeah, that makes sense. With an Ethernet, rather than wirelessly. Um, moving on, we have here. This is good news as well. The DualShock Four controller is going to get support on Steam. Now, you can do this already, uh, Bluetooth and things like that, but this is going to be more like, uh, you know, what would you call it, uh, native support through an API call, not some sort of uh, done, you know, outside of Steam through Bluetooth. Yeah, I was going like, to say, I can do this on a, I, that's how I play most of my Steam games is with my PS4 controller, because it's just, Bluetooth easily hooks up to a Mac, so that's what I've used, but it's not for all games. Many games, it doesn't work, unfortunately. Right, so now they're going to. Actually, you know, I guess broaden the use of the of the DualShock Four, which would be nice. Yeah, um, I like the DualShock Four equally as the as the Xbox One. So if I can get more use out of either one of them, then that's cool with me. And I guess they had some new uh, recent conference Steam Dev Days, and that's where a lot of this news is coming from. And they're also going to expand uh, support to other controllers in the future. So if you've been hanging on to the uh, GameCube controller, you know, hey, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Let's see. We haven't talked PSVR yet, so let's get a little of these uh, news stories. Uh, PSVR can be used on the PC, Xbox One, and Wii U in cinema mode. So another thing that I talked about on the 40 cast the other day. Um, you know, so if you want to play Gears on your uh, PlayStation VR headset, you can do that. You know, these are all USB USB powered devices. So plug it into your Xbox One and it should, should boot up in cinema mode. Um, you know, your mileage will vary, I'm sure, from game to game. But if you want to try that out, you can go ahead and do that. Now, does anybody know exactly what cinema mode specifically looks like? Like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I can say is an Oculus. It's like a 3D cinema, right? Or, you know, it's like picture being in a room with like a... Big screen in front of you. A big screen in front of you, right? And there's like you can in the Oculus. I think you could change the screen. It could be curved. It could be wide. And I even think you could see like seats a little bit if you look to the really far to the left and right. It's almost like you're in a home theater. That's what I'm curious. Of. Like if I looked straight up or down or left or right, would I see the supposed virtual room I'm in, or would yes. the, the screen but move with me? On, in Oculus, I can tell you, you could you could see the room didn't move with you. You could look around the room. Okay, I was going to say, because if I just had the screen like right on my face and no matter which way I looked, I couldn't look away from whatever game I'm playing, I think that would make me sick very quickly. No, it wasn't like that. You could move away and you ah. could look to the left and right and see like, you know, whatever those walls look like in a movie theater or a home theater at home and the, the floor was kind of pitched, you know what I mean? Like you were walking down into the theater. So I can't really speak to what PR, PSVR cinema mode looks like, but at least that was my Oculus experience. That would be pretty. It'd be pretty great for people who don't have huge TVs. You know what I mean? Like yeah. who just? I mean, but of, again, I don't see a lot of people banging down four hundred dollars for PSVR if they haven't already probably put a lot of money into their TV. But it's interesting. It worked. You know, it was a. They're calling this a happy accident. It wasn't something they certainly designed to work with other systems. Mm -hmm. But uh, it does work. So, I mean, I think people who are on the fence, you know, and they already have multiple consoles, it certainly it gives you more usage, right? Yeah, definitely. More, more realistic applications that you can use it for. I know some people are having issues with cinema mode on the PSVR. They're saying there's a drift. Um, to be honest, the only person I've seen express that is Zion Tane from the OMG Hour. Uh, he certainly makes it seem like it's a, it's a, it's a wider um, known issue because he's talked to other people about it, but he's the only person I've seen so far uh, complain that there's some sort of issue with the PSVR headset when it comes to cinema mode. Um, another thing here, PSVR is being sold at profit. I uh, toyed around with making this a Dillagaff. I'm not sure what you guys feel about console manufacturers selling thing, selling these types of things at profit on day one. In this article here, it says, you know, typically, um, you know, that these consoles are sold at a loss in the beginning to make them more affordable for people. And then over time, they, you know, they can make them cheaper and then they start making a profit. Do you guys have an uh, issue with them making money right out of the shoot? Well, I mean, they are a business. It did cost them money to make these things, and that's typically how businesses work. So I feel like anyone who demands that they sell it for a loss just so they can have it for cheaper, I think that's pretty entitled so i i wouldn't go yeah. as far as to say that i would love it to be cheaper but i don't think i can't get i can't fault them for wanting to make a profit mm. is yeah. anybody surprised at how well it's being received i expect it to be shit on a lot more than it is i think people want vr to do well so they're getting some pretty decent reviews um but people are pointing out uh, the flaws in it, but I think the way this is being done, it's not getting piled on like most things do. But everybody piles on it when there's something wrong, you know. With this, they're pointing out that there are flaws with it, but they're not piling on about it. It's just, you know, this is here's the flaws, but here's the positive side of it too. Have you so, been to the PlayStation Store too and seen all the games available for it? They look terrible. It looks like a lot of shovelware oh, yeah, bullshit. Haven't. It's like PlayStation oh, yeah. VR experience. They don't even call them games. It's just like, yeah. I mean, and they're, and those things that look terrible, they're like 20, 30 bucks. Like how yeah. that's, I would, I'd be very pissed if I had a, a PlayStation VR right now, nothing to play. Well, most of the pundits out there, the experts, the people that get paid to talk about this, unlike us <laughs> saying PSVR has the most compelling 
games to play right now. So Jeff Gersman said, you know, I'm disappointed that, you know, the system has some issues and flaws here, like Jay just said. He goes, it's too bad because they have the best launch release. They have actual games that I want to play. Ugh, I, I didn't see. When I looked yesterday, I think I saw two games that looked interesting. I didn't see many. Uh, Keep talking, or or someone will explode. I think that's I think that's the uh, name of the game. That looked really interesting. I know it's an Oculus game, mm-hmm. so I, I'd like to play that. But and there was one other one. I wish I could remember it for the sake of the podcast. But I thought most of it looked bad. I got to carve out some time. And what they did like a six hour show playing VR. So they really covered Giant Bomb. Really covered it from top to bottom. And when he you know he came out at the end, Jeff said, you know, they really got a lot of good games that I wish I could continue playing, but there are some issues with it that prevent that from happening. I. I caught just a little bit, and they were playing the game and you know, typical uh, PlayStation stuff. It aired out and brings you to that screen and gives you some sort of you know, string of numbers and letters of an error code. <laughs> you know, things like that were happening. So it could be just launch day stuff. Yeah. Uh, last bit of news here. Xbox has three more games for backwards compatibility. Eat Lead, Silent Hill Downpour, and Puzzle Quest. Those uh, releases follow the releases of Jurassic Park, the game, Battle Stations Midway, Dragon's Lair, and Tour de France 2011. Nice. Is he Eat Lead? Is that Matt Hazard's Eat Lead? Is that the same thing? Yes. Um, let's move into the uh, the plugs and stuff like that. There's a cool article on Jezebel about this girl who wore a dragon's tail for a whole week and she goes on and talks about her, people's reactions uh on the train walking around new york city her experiences um wearing it into the bathroom and things like that she said her only stipulation was that she had to wear it like clothes and when she's at home she takes her shoes off so when she got home she would take the dragon tail off but everywhere else uh she was wearing it so if you want a <laughs> funny read with lots of pictures uh check that out i'll have that in the show notes Pretty interesting. Um, yeah, some some funny stuff. Yeah, there. thanks for sharing. I, I I I did I did read that and enjoyed it. Um, so I already talked about the Samsung TV. Um, so far, I'm getting good results on that. I was also sent this keyboard, uh, Pence, Pencilic, P-E-N-C-L-I-C. Looks like maybe it is a uh, Scandinavian company. It's a wireless keyboard, very small and plastic. Um, it's a USB keyboard, so I'm trying that out. Uh, mixed results right now, but I've only been using it for less than 24 hours. Still trying to get the hang of it. After using the same keyboard for, I don't know, seven or eight years, you're used to things. So yeah. I'm just trying, to, just trying to get used to this one right now. I do like that it's small, and that I can move it around You know, wherever I want. There's no wires and things like that. Hasn't lost connection. Comes with rechargeable batteries. So I'll nice. get that aspect. Um plugs i'll get those out of the way new episode of the 40 cast this week we said goodbye to keith uh keith was on from episode one to 300 i'm sure he missed a few here and there but uh we thank keith for all the good times in the 40 cast and he'll be missed so go check out that episode it dropped today and uh that should do it who wants to go next jay uh go for it oh, Corey, go ahead go ahead go ahead Corey. Okay, I don't have a lot to plug, actually, this week. I haven't worked on much uh, lately on Bigo Games. I do an upcoming Gamer Parent article. It's going to take a little while, uh, which, by the way, I am a um, writer for Bigo Games, and I run their social media sites, so follow Bigo Games, B-A-G-O Games, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, because that would be awesome and would make me look good because I run their social media. And uh, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, if you'd like, check out our Discord channel, the... Uh, Gamers and Beta Discord channel. It's a great place to uh, have an exchange with the community. And we've set up, uh, like we mentioned before, a Gears Night, which we plan to start setting up a regular uh, Beers and Gears Night where we can just sit around and bullshit and play multiplayer and horde and stuff. So if you're interested in that, check out our Discord channel. Yes, we announce when we'll be playing on there. So it's been working pretty good unless somebody falls asleep like I did last night. <laughs> um, our uh, Beers and Gears administrator, Sean... Um, I haven't seen him once, and we've played, what, twice or th- two or three times this week. What's going on, Sean? Where you been, buddy? <laughs> we miss you. Mm-hmm. Miss you. Right, um, 
I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, my grandmother passed last week, and we had the funeral on Friday. And, um, you know, I, I put it out there, and uh, I want to thank everyone that uh, sent condolences. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, some people uh, private messaged me and, you know, uh, communicated to me, you know, if they needed, if I needed anything. And, and uh, I greatly appreciate that. So thank you very much for all of you that have done that. And and those of those on the podcast also. So thank you very much. Um, everything went pretty good. Uh, you know, we had the funeral. The family got together. And luckily, I have a pretty close-knit family. And my grandmother was 92 and she was uh she was ready to move on and 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 uh, was happy with the life that she had had so um it it made it a little bit easier but uh, uh all the uh condolences also helped to to uh know that, that there's other people out there that they care so thank you very much for that sorry to hear certainly um sure we can all relate to some aspect of that never easy so we appreciate you uh being here tonight we know it's not easy to put that stuff behind you so again thank you well, and thank you for having me on so mm-hmm. and uh, as usual uh our uh podcast could possibly benefit if you uh would give us some five stars and whatnot so if you would uh, go on and uh to uh iTunes or however you may get the uh, podcast and uh, rate us and uh, put in a review, we would appreciate it. Yes. Uh, the numbers have been uh, excellent the last couple of weeks, so we appreciate all the new listeners that have uh, subscribed and tuned in. Hopefully you've been uh, compelled to keep listening throughout the uh, upcoming episodes. We're going to have some uh, new stuff and always try to keep it exciting for you. So thank you and welcome. Yes, I, sh- I should have a game. I was supposed to have a game this episode, but uh, too busy. So I should have a game next episode, and uh, I'd like to do another skit too. So hopefully we can get around to, to writing another skit. But, yes, thank you for all our new listeners. All right, Jay, why don't you do us the honors? Until next time, same beta time, same beta channel, and uh, maybe we'll have an added co-host next time. See you. There goes the neighborhood. You want me to copy what?